Buckle up, kids. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. Excited about today's show. Hope you are too. It's a film, a film show. We love film shows, you know? And thanks. Uh, you know, I hope I don't get flagged for using that footage. Usually they catch the audio. I thought we'd put one of the incendiary. I thought breaking the song Breaking Point that's on our the record that's coming out would be was is kind of appropriate for that uh, taxi driver, Travis Bickle, you know, stuff. So, breaking point! Yeah, thank you, Tony. Yeah, record's moving forward, finally. It's, yes, Donnie's coming on today. We're going to be talking film. We are excited about that. Larry Kelly, what's up? What's up, brah? Yeah. Boy, would I, I'd sure love to show you the cover of the record. <laughs> Probably get screamed at, you know. Um, that said, everybody all right? Yo, shouting out Debo to Pro. What's up, Victoria? What's up, John in London? Big Tony Palmasano. What's up, John? Hey, Layla Concrete Ties. What's up? Come on now. And everybody else that's tuning in today. Hey, Courtney, how are you? Travis Bickle, a band too. I think that song probably he, Travis, Travis, Bick, Travis Bickle, a band too. I think that song probably be flagged too. No, that song's not flagged because it's not released yet. That's one of our songs. So that's not going to happen. That said. What's, what's up? On? What's going on? Let's bring everybody on here. Are you doing all right now? You got to unmute yourself there, Tootsles. Come on. Uh oh, she's. Unmute speed. yours. Hey. Hi. 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 Oh my God. Hi. Everything's just falling apart. I have matches huh. in the background. Look at this. It's just. Gina, get your friend yes. together there, will you? Yeah, I, I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> Yeah, I'm telling you. Jesus. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. You're going on. Merch? What do you got you're, over there? You're going on. I hear uh that you guys are going on in what is it? Camp Punk Sylvania? Is that what it's called? Oh yeah. So we are super excited about Camp Punk Sylvania. Mm -hmm. It is um Riot Squad Media puts this together. And Riot Squad Media is a female owned and operated media company. And they have 50 bands, three stages over three days, and they asked us to be a part of it. So oh, nice. come hang out with us. Our friends are playing, right? So Carbon Parade is playing. Let me say, well, the Suicide Machines are playing. Uh, we, we, we've had them on. They, uh, yeah. You know, um, Super fun. Else? I don't so see we've got, have... got War on Women. Mm -hmm. Where's Carbon? Oh. They're the, well, oh, they could have fit all I of the bands. I see, there. I see, no, I see Car Palm. I see, yeah, they're right kind of like right in the middle. In there. the middle, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so, yeah, that's cool. So it's a really great a patrol is playing, uh, Vulture Raid is playing, Stop the Presses, Lindley from Bad Cop. Bad Cop is doing like a side thing. Uh, right. Lenny Lashley will be there, and they also have like a lot of um, fun little um, events and plans going on. There'll, there'll be like a, um, a uh, what is it, a scavenger hunt at night. There mm -hmm. are, um, oh, and there is our um, our new- Is that uh, right? Yo, that's Larry the Hunter's hometown. Yeah. <laughs> is, right? is he the, wait, is he the Scranton Strangler? Uh, nah. You know what, Larry, there's no that. excuse for you not to come. So come hang yeah, out with us, exactly. But this yep. tank top is going to be exclusive to Camp Punk. We mm -hmm. designed it to, you know, kind of match our Stronger Together CD. So you'll be able to pick that up. Um, and, and as always, it's a charity. Only CD. at Camp Punk, right? Only at Camp Punk. It's a Camp Punk exclusive. So, yeah, but there'll be like, you know, um, bonfires and scavenger hunts and sing-alongs and all kinds of camp fun activities. So and there's a full carnival, too. There's a yeah. full-on carnival on site. There's food. There's yeah. fun. There's bands playing. Come hang out. There's Come vendors. Out. So all kinds of vendors. 
don't bother coming to my Bowery Electric show. Come to hang out at this thing. That's on Sunday. Well, listen, it's on Sunday. Friday. I Saturday. feel like it's far enough, you know, if, you know. Is, this is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, right? This yes. is a once a year thing. Yes. Okay. Yes. Listen, yes. anybody that fucking comes to this thing, if I fucking <laughs> find out that you're at this fucking thing in Pennsylvania, you know what happens to you? You end up on... Uh, where's my list? <laughs> you end up on the list. <laughs> Let me Fuck tell you, around. anybody who on comes out will fly to an hour ten. Yeah, right. Better we'll wear a fucking. You better wear a fucking. Dis- Listen, go, say Friday, go Friday. Have a fucking day. Go Saturday. <laughs> fucking run down Broadway naked with a fucking candle up your ass. I don't care. Go Sunday, and I find out you're there. So car bomb is playing on Sunday. Too. Car bomb's playing? Tell Mike he's out of the fucking bed. He's out of my bed. <laughs> Fuck that so guy. Mike isn't going to be there because Mike's having a baby. So there you go. Oh, tell me about it. It's fucking Mike and his baby. Aww. <laughs> Listen, you know, let me tell you. Yeah, here's something else. Something else. Listen. Listen. If you're going to breed and you're going to have kids, oh, don't fucking shit. join a band with me. Oh. All right? Oh, my God. I only, I, I, I only want people that are available in my band. So if you're thinking of breeding on this planet, if that's what you want to do, don't be in a band with me. No druggies and no breeders. No breeders, right. Listen, drummer wanted. No drugs, no alcohol, no breeding. <laughs> we give you a vasectomy. That's it. Fucking, a- <laughs> fucking animals. How about, uh, you know, this real quick, this Sunday, this past Sunday, we had a Bowery Electric show, and these guys yeah. played. Yo, Steven, this is a great shot. He looks like uh, Iron Fist. He's, he's like yeah. Iron Fist from from, from yeah. Marvel Comics. He's like, look at, look. Yep. Yeah, he's, they, those guys are so much fun. So fun. Yeah, that's, that's they were the great. take. Yep. Yeah, the take were great. Um, what else? Um, who else was great? All right. Six, six man you know, this time. You know who was, you know, who was really great? Who fucking really, really kind of ruled the day was Maafa. Hells yeah. Yeah. They were great. They were really good. They were really, really good. There's That's a Nate. great shot too. Yeah. I don't know the bass player's name. I know Nate. I forget yeah. his name because I'm horrible with names, but he's yeah. super nice guy. So talented. They're all, you know, they all are professional musicians. They have yeah. lots of other projects. Yeah. And there's all sorts of instrumentation going on in that band. There's all kinds of percussion. It's really unique sounding, you know? Yeah, it's great. Yep. And they have their new music out and also a song on the comp. So, yeah, we love them. How about this uh, guy? Sad. Anybody know? Oh. I just Anybody out there know who this guy is? Right answers only, please. Who is this? Sort of a little, a little unrecognizable. Yeah, from his foreign for, from his foreign life. Does anybody know who this is? Yeah, I was a little, I was a little shocked when I saw him. I was like, huh. hey, super sweet guy, also. And this is a dude I've known for. 40 something years. I, I Super sorta... sweet guy. Is it Frank Carbone? No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, he may or may not have been crucified for our sins. No, it's not Dave Mustaine. Dave Mustaine. And it, it's not Peter Steele. Yes, it's Sab Gray from Iron Cross. That is that was funny, Sab Gray who wrote, <laughs> who wrote the song. I'm glad you caught that. I got it. I got it. Yep. I gotta say, I gotta say the the slashers who were last minute edition. I thought they oh, crushed it. They were not great. the slashers. 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 The sla- I know. They it's get upset you when that. you throw the the in there. Because, and and shame on me because I hate when people say the serial poets too. It's just serial poets. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. knock it off. They're so it's fun. Like, They're super fun. Is it, is it misfits or the misfits? Is it Ramones or the Ramones? Is it is the it, incendiary device? Is it bad brains or the bad brains? You know, it's funny because in the sixties, is off the hook. Yeah, in the sixties, they used to intro- they used to refer to the Cream and the Pink Floyd yeah, and everything. Right. Yeah, that's right. 
Is you know it women of the pit? No. Or the you know women of the was, pit? You know who was great and a lot of fun? Mr. Pickle. Mr. Pickle. Mm. Yeah, they, they were, were fun. They, they, they were really fun. I, I got a kick out of they started one song and they stopped it. And the other guy said, no, I want to sing that one. And they started the song again with a different vocalist. That's cool. They were fun. And they had, it was their first show in like a decade, right? Yeah. Anthony they, goes, is it the take or the take? <laughs> just, it's just take. <laughs> and, dude. I These were great photos. Silent Sequels Death is such a freak show. It's oh my like, God. they got a dude that's seven <laughs> feet tall. They got a dude that's like, whatever. They got a fat guy. They got a skinny guy. They got, it's like, they are like the most unesthetically matching. It's very, it's very body positive bands. Yes, but Scott Earth. Scott Earth was it's body positive bands. Amazing. I got to see Scott Earth. He's he's so he's a tr he's a tremendous front man. I think. You know? yeah, absolutely. absolutely. He really he's is. Great. Here he is with a lot. Here he is. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. cute. And he actually yeah. looks tall there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Next to a lago. Yeah. That's well, right, Johnny Cray. Johnny Cray's <laughs> and Mr. Pickle. Yeah, which is great to see him too. You know the. Uh, oh, that's funny. It's Mr. Are we Pickle. missing someone? It's, it was Mr. It's Mr. Pickle. Pickle. It's Mr. Pickle, not it's Mr. Just, Pickles. It's just Pickle. <laughs> We're just mangling everybody's names today. That's hey, it. I, I want to make an announcement real quick here. This. Sunday, because God knows I don't want anybody watching this show or going to my Bowery Electric <laughs> events. But this Sunday, if you're looking for something to do, um, don't watch this show. Go down to Generation Records because Roger Moret will be down there doing a book signing uh, for the United Blood Legacy album. There's only 90 of them. There's 90 of each. There's, yes, there's two releases. There's this one and... Why did he tell me there's 90 of each? Uh, I'm not sure wow. what the second release is, but this is going on on Sunday. Is Anthony oh, wow. there now waiting in line? Yeah. <laughs> Tony, big Tony Palmasano, are you online yet? Shirt on. <laughs> you know? We missed Tony on Sunday. That's right. Yeah. I, I look, look, the right shirt I'm there. so there. <laughs> yeah, see? <laughs> yep. Yeah, this looks cool. Yeah, yeah, I got. I, you know what? I'll have to add one more to the collection of my like four different United Bloods. You know. <laughs> yes. That said, um, hey, gonna hey. be a fun. Gonna be a yeah. It's Tony's like already. Tony's on his way. Yes. <laughs> I have my question all queued up. Yeah. Listen, yeah. I me, me and Rochelle have been watching fucking Scorsese movies back to back to back to back for like a week now. Yeah, there's you a lot what? of them. There really is. There really we is. Did, and I mean, this is just this is just the part one. This is just the first bunch. Yeah, and what I found it was interesting was that he's a he's a punk fan. Oh yeah, you should invite him to Barry. And we're going to talk about that on the show. So that said, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Let me get the show on the road. Um, let's hang out. See you guys in a little while. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. Hey. Thank uh, you. And I, I, this week, last thing, got to say happy birthday to Tristan DeGraves this week. Who? You should meet him. Nice guy. <laughs> yeah. He's in the in he's, in the in he's in the incendiary devices. <laughs> the incendiary devices. <laughs> Wait, I mean, since we're talking about Roger, today's Roger's hey, anniversary. What's so up, happy bro? anniversary, we're, Roger. We're hey, bro. How you doing? Hi, yeah. It's good to see you. Wait, today's Roger's You're anniversary. Close. So happy anniversary, Roger. Okay. Very nice. Listen, don't listen. Don't bring up any of my band members' names on this show, all right? <laughs> Happy <laughs> birthday, Tristan. So sick of those guys. You're a great bass player, Tristan. <laughs> Breaking point. What about me? I'm great too, you know. <laughs> Actually, he's an incredibly talented guy, and I'm he very is. fortunate. Very yes, fortunate he is. to uh to have you know have a musical uh partnership with the guy oh and, and you know what and we'll get to this later but i finally convinced him to yes. do yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I saw this. yeah and aaron too and, and aaron. Have fun. Yep. that's gonna be a great one yeah yeah 
and good food too. Yep. That oh, said, awesome. all I'll right. See I'll see you guys later. All right. Okay. Bye. Ciao. Bye, Gina. Bye, Stephen. <laughs> bye, Lori. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, and we are sponsored by I, 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 I'm not just stepping stone. We are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, 126 Hardcore Clothing, and Upstate Records. They're a New York based DIY independent metal and hardcore label. Founded in 2017, they broke into the scene with their inaugural 26 fan compilation and since then have churned out over 80 releases in their brief five year history. Out now are new releases by Mark Rizzo's band Revenge Beast, Carl from Earth Crisis's Freya, Fury of Five, Angry Corpses, with a few more surprises in the works. Check them out and a whole lot more at www.upstaterecords.com. Use the code STONE10 for 10% off. Let's clear the deck. Let's bring our guest on. Everybody okay in the chat room? Joe Frank, what's up? Thank you, Brooke. I appreciate it. Let me get my intro. Let's clear the deck. And away we go. Today's guest is an American writer, director, musician, and artist manager hailing from Westchester County, New York. As a musician... He's known for his work with the bands Blind Side and Scarhead. As a writer, he's the co-author of Columbo, The Unsolved Murder. Here today to share his perspective on the career of filmmaker Martin Scorsese, please welcome back to the show, coming at us from White Plains, New York, Mr. Don Capria. Brother. True. <laughs> How you doing? Sorry it took so long, man. Uh, you know. That's quite all right. That's quite all right. It's How's uh, things? Things are good, man. It's it's been a minute since we jumped on the show together, but I'm glad yeah. we're back talking about films again. For sure, and and super exciting. You're in pre-production for a new film. Is this something you want to talk about at all? Uh, it's a bit of a secret project, but it's a horror film. It's a okay. slasher. And, Fair enough. Uh, and yeah, we start filming in the fall. Um, and uh, it's it's a pretty exciting. It does have a a bit of a, a musical. Uh, component to it which is you know great from my background of like blending the two worlds that i'm most in love with which is killing people and music i mean uh horror movies and music <laughs> <laughs> did you did you write it yeah i wrote i'm um, directing yep and it, it came from it was inspired by true events i guess i could kind of say um yeah. which which was just like you know shooting music you know i have a similar background to yours where i i got into right. filmmaking on music video sets and yeah, yeah. you know you're always working around musical artists you kind of see stories coming out of the behind the scenes and the actual moments and that's kind of where this all came about for me sure and and we've talked about this you know uh you know one of the films we both enjoy and we recognize is is being like almost borderline genius is the green room mm -hmm. you know like coming from a music background it's one of the I, you know i saw that film and i was like fuck how could I how could I not have fucking figured that one out, you know? Yeah, yeah, I was telling you, I, I saw that opening night with Danny Diablo, and uh when we went there and we watched it, it was just like we knew that that writer, director, Soliner, that guy's in the scene. Like this is something you can't come and make a punk movie and be someone that's not involved in punk, same for hardcore, same and sure. like that that guy really gave you a good taste of that that culture. Yeah, he did he did a really good job. You know, I don't know about you, but once in a while I'll see a film and I'll just go, fuck. How can I, it's, it was like writing, how could I not have thought of this? How did I not write this script? This was right, like right here, you know? Yeah. I mean, think about it. Someone eventually is going to make some really, uh, there's so much, so many moments, right, that we know yeah. about from all of our friends. Right. And it's like someone's eventually going to grab the Lower East Side and do yeah, something yeah. in our space. And and it's it's public domain, so it's up to guys like me and you to make sure we yeah. talk after this to discuss when that's going to happen. <laughs> right, know? right, right, for 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 sure. So let's 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 get into this. There's there's a lot there's a lot to 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 get going here. Um, you know, I, I guess I'll just start. Um, you know, I'll just start with with uh, you know so, some text and, and and some information. You know, Martin Scorsese, who's now uh, here. This is a shot here. Uh, taken by our friend um, David Godless, who was on the show. 
Uh, Martin Scorsese is 80 years old now. He was born in he was born in Flushing, Queens, and moved to Little Italy. His right. parents worked in the garment district and were actors. Uh, as a child, he had asthma and couldn't play sports and take part in activities with other children. So his parents and older brother would take him to the movies. At this stage, he developed a passion for cinema. Mm. You know? Yeah. Yeah, he was uh, he was little little Italy kid, right? And then yeah. I, I he he was up in the Bronx at some point because he went to Cardinal Hayes. That's right. That's um, right. Later yeah. on, he went. Later on, he went to he went to Cardinal uh, Hayes High School uh, in in the Bronx. Yeah, a- absolutely. But mm-hmm. inter- interesting that um, his parents, who who will probably come up later, who turn up in all his films, yeah. right? Especially his, that- mo- his mom is one of the most memorable characters in the films that she's jumped in you know it's it's amazing and the dad you know now that i just watched a ton of this shit it's like this says he's dead this says he's dead. And, and you're like probably the most i mean with his dad probably the the most and i guess it's both good fellas right right he, he's the one that shoots pesci when when they're gonna make him in, in Goodfellas, when he walks into the garage, she thinks he's getting made. It's Scorsese's dad that shoots him, right? Yeah, and and her in Goodfellas, you know, yeah, yeah. that's that's definitely in our in our talks coming up. But her yeah. her role the is Hulk. so amazing. The Hulk. amazing. It was the Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she turns up. Yeah, yeah. Her, his parents uh, and him, you know, he 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 turns up in a lot of in a lot of his films. Yeah, yeah, it, it, Hitchcockian. It. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like fine, you know. And you and I think, then you know, it's repetitive. It's kind of like find that moment, you know, like um, a much later film. But I just remember like that brief scene in Gangs of New York, you know, yeah. where he's just like sitting at the table with all, you know, and it, it, it's just a moment where you're kind of like, ah, oh, you feel a little refresher, like there he is, you know. Um, yeah. And and I I always got the sense I think you know one of the first things without studying filmmaking, just like looking at at films that he's made and one thing i knew that i felt was distinct about him i always felt a sense of family kind of yeah. environment when looking at his films yeah. and maybe that first came from the repetition of actors that he continued to work with you yeah. know uh it was just always like, and then when you started to learn wait his mom's in a movie his dad's in a movie yeah. you know like all this stuff it, it really kind of like showed you that this guy must have such an amazing cast and crew uh energy when he's on set you know funny you should say that because in rewatching and rewatching all these films, like, and taking notes, and we we basically watched one a day for like a week, and like, it's incredible the patterns that develop. You know, you see, oh, that's the actress that was just in this. Oh, there, and and some of them are like, I don't, I almost want to say character actors, you, you know, mm-hmm. um, uh, but you, you well, see Vic, patterns. Vic, Victor, Victor Argo, take that one. You know, he oh. got. He Come worked with now. Victor Argo on Boxcar, and then he just, you know, he's not he's not this guy that I was like, oh, my God, I know that guy. I love that guy. But him and Scorsese's relationship, he knew when he needed that, that was the guy. Pull the Victor Argo card. In Mean Streets, he was um, he was Harvey Keitel's uncle's, like, uh, sidekick, that mafia guy. And then watching fucking Taxi Driver in that bodega scene when, 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 when Travis Bickle, Bickle kills the robber. He's the bodega owner guy. Yep. Yep. Yeah, he, he shows up. Hey, Ray Hogan, Ray Hogan says, not a question, but thank you. The Joe Coloma book was so, so well researched, sourced, and readable and educational. Of oh, course. Thank you, Ray. I, I appreciate yeah. you, uh, your praise. Yeah, yeah. Um, so keeping it sort of on his, uh, on his youth, really interesting that as a kid, he had asthma and you know, he wasn't out there doing sports with other kids. And, you know, he he spent a lot of time, uh, you know, in the theater, you know, in in in, in movies. And uh, he just developed a, uh, a a real passion for it. Uh, interesting how how that uh, how that developed. Um, but is that his his aspirations? Right. Mm-hmm. He, he was going to be. A yeah, priest, a priest. And, and, yeah. and I think there was something I don't want to get it wrong, but I think like he f- he failed a test or something. Oh, that's and, right. That's and, right. And that's no, what he led, did. Yeah. That's what led this guy to NYU. That's and right. if he didn't fail that test, thank God the tests are pretty hard for the church. They would have never had all of these movies from him. Could you imagine? Oh, um, he, he went to he went to Cardinal Hayes, like you said, 
And then he went to NYU. He earned he earned a BA in English in 1964. Then he got his MA from NYU School of Education in 68, a year after the school was founded. But um, so, I mean, he's always been the great flag waver for NYU film school. You know, mm -hmm. it's like fucking Martin Scorsese. What do you mean? You, you know, like like Scorsese went to NYU, and that's always like been probably you know. They're forever in his debt, man, because could you like probably tens of thousands of aspiring filmmakers have, have, have gone to NYU as a result of Scorsese attending. Yeah, it's a, it's a decider, right? It's the same thing with sports and football. It's That's like, right. you know, when you're, you're between Ohio State and Michigan, you That's know, right. you're thinking of the alum and you're just like, man, I like so and so I'm going there. Yeah. A an interesting thing I picked up um, as a teenager. Um, I guess back then, you, I guess in some capacity, you were able to uh, rent films, right? Not, there was no VHS, but you could, you would rent, I guess they were, you know, 16. Proje yeah, projection. Yep. Right. So as a teenager, he frequently rented the film Tales of Hoffman, which is 1951, from a store that had only one copy of the reel. He yep. was only one of two people who regularly rented it. Wait, the other George, was George Romero? Romero. Yeah, I knew that. Yep, yep. Wow, amazing, amazing. That's amazing. I mean, he he comes from the era. You know, I get, I don't want to fast forward and get into it, but like, yeah, he comes from that era of the, the dawn of all these amazing filmmakers. And I know not everyone was in the that that crew, the um the movie brats, but um there was there was so many filmmakers that came out of the 1960s schooling era and then in the 1970s you know one of our, our greatest decades of cinema um give us give us a couple give us a couple names well i mean if we start with the movie brats um which was kind of the click that he got involved with is five of them it was scorsese brian de palma george lucas francis ford coppola and the guy that probably crushed it uh, steven spielberg I mean, like, though, look at all of the the films that they've produced and and the length of their careers and how they're still out there. Like you just said, he's yeah. eighty and he's got another film coming out at the yeah. end of the year, and sure. and he's just he's getting him and I, um, you know, I always think about Ridley Scott too. How like I, I would just sit and watch his B roll if I had to pay. $15 in a theater. And they said it was just B roll from Ridley Scott. I'll just right. watch it because they yeah. just, they're getting so much better and, yeah. and better as it goes, as time goes by. Um, and, and these guys that he came up with some of the best ever, but then, you know, a little bit older than him was Cassavetes, um, who, who, who was a huge, huge, inf he, it, it, I don't say his mentor, but was a huge, a, a lot of his filmmaking style was, was yep. lifted right out of the Cassavetes handbook. Yeah, he learned a lot from Cassavetes. He learned from Corman. Um, yeah, well, yeah. And, and, and I, I think that like those guys in that era, uh, it was Quentin Tarantino one time, I was watching an interview who said it best. And he's like, look, I don't know if he's talking about ping pong or tennis. He's like, if you're playing a match against people that you could beat, you're going to destroy everyone and you're going to come out a winner. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was something with time, a race. He said, if you're running a race against people you know you could beat, you're going to destroy everyone. You're going to come out a winner. He goes, but if you go into the same race with people that you know are faster than you, you're not going to win the race, but you're going to come out a faster runner. Yeah. He goes, because they're going to challenge you That's and you're right. going to have a better time. And, and, and look at that time in that era. And they surrounded themselves with all these super talented people that were making movies. And it just made each one of them better and better and better. Yeah, it's like, uh, in a way, it's like being in a band, too. It's like you want to play on bills with bands that, you know, are going to raise, you know, raise the level of the whole thing and not just let's just play with a bunch of scrubs and crush them. You know, yep. you want to you want to play yeah. at a level with, you know, with the sick of it alls and life of agonies and, yeah, and, and the rebel mat and the rebel matic. So that's who we want to play with, you know? Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um he comes out of the gate with a bunch of short films. Uh, what's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? It's not just you, Murray. And The Big Shave, which is probably the most, um, uh, you know, uh, known known of that. Does a couple of short films. Listen, you know, the guy the guy um, was in the mix from the beginning, right? The, all these short films were, were entered into film festivals. And, you know, he, he, really, he really worked it. And his first feature film in 1967 was Who's That Knocking at My Door? Uh, and that was his first film with Harvey Keitel 
and 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 Thelma Schoonmaker. Am I pronouncing that right? Yes, Schoonmaker, and and they were both students uh, at that's NYU right. with him at the time. That's how that came to be. Um, yep. Kaitel, obviously, you know, they got to work together on um, a couple films in the seventies. The, the you know, Mean Streets, Taxi Driver, and um, uh, Alice doesn't live here anymore. Yep. You know all repeating again to that family environment. And then yeah. if you're, if you're talking about a uh, shoemaker, Thelma, she just edited the last movie. So she's like edited every Incredible. single Scorsese Incredible. film since he started. And just this new one with Leonardo, uh, is what, what's that over the, the blue moon. What's it over the sub moon? Um, yeah, it's, it's the, it's, yeah. it's, oh man, that's his guy, Leonardo DiCaprio now, but we'll get to that. Yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll, Part we'll, two. We'll part two but just yeah. uh, just talking a bit you know again what? about you that, that it'll family probably, environment it'll probably be part three <laughs> yeah i mean because so, think about it it's you've got the, so many films just in this decade that we're you know we're covering up to yeah. maybe 1990 right well then you've got 1990 to 2010 then he doesn't stop it's there's no yeah. pause well he just has an incredible prolific career you know um yeah. after and this first feature uh was shot over two years it was really sort of cobbled together um you know, and, and interesting and interesting. No one over 25 years old worked on that film, uh, his first his first film. Um, an interesting, interesting um, fact that in between that film and really the first film that really comes on our radar screen, uh, Boxcar Bertha, he was uh, he was a uh, he worked on the Woodstock documentary editing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was also with Thelma. That's right. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, and I so. think the Woodstock film is where he met for the first time Cassavetes. Ah. Um, so, so um, you know, the, 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 the Thelma and him starting with that working and he's, he's done so many documentaries too. That's another thing people, you know, Italian American, like he's, he's always yeah. stayed in, in all spaces of storytelling for the visual arts. Like he's, you know, music videos and whatnot, yeah. but um, yeah, the dawn of it really for him uh, was Boxcar Bertha was what like the first official official release. Yeah, yeah. here you go, and mm -hmm. and and this, I, I, I guess this like like a bunch of other directors is a Roger Corman film, and the, and, and the Roger Corman sort of uh, uh, machinery, you know, churned out a lot, you know, gave a lot of these young directors an op an opportunity to sort of hone their wares, you know, and. You know, this was a first. This this was the first one, and uh, you gave this a watch. Yeah, um, look, this is this is you know one of the one of the Scorsese what what I believe the book to cinema mm. excellent exercises that he has done so many times over and over again, where he gets a copy of a book, he reads the book, and he visualizes it and turns it sure. into something amazing. I think that that you know Corman probably had a, a lot of a lot more control maybe than Scorsese. And that's kind of where the, the feedback came from uh, John Cassavetes uh, basically saying to him, like, look, the film's good, but this yeah. is not you. This doesn't, that's this right. is not stylistically who you're trying to be. I know that already. I know you as a human being. Um, he's like, so just like get away from the exploitation stuff and yeah. get into the art of filmmaking and find your voice. Um, Cause the film, you know, there's rumors about that film. Like, um, it's, it's, so if anyone doesn't know the film, it's, it's a set in the great depression era and, um, Bertha, who is, is the book is based on three different, uh, females. Um, I forget their names, but the writer was thinking about a few different women and it was about her, you know, her, her travels as, uh, what do they call it in punk when you're, when you're jumping on the back of the trains and, uh, um, hopping from, from place to place. And she just had this kind of click of guys and she was promiscuous. She was sleeping with them. They were hustling guys. They had a, you know, they had a card hustler, uh, a card sharp and um, just a lot of trouble with the law. And it had a lot to do society. Like the elevated part of it all is about uh, communism versus capitalism is the basic message of the film. But yeah, it, you know, I, I, I have to, I have to say, you know, I, I have never seen this film. I don't know this film. You know, yeah, it's it's a really good film. It has, you know, I think back then, you know, it's Barbara Hershey 
she she plays the the woman who's you know not a prostitute, but she's definitely right. promiscuous. She could have been a prostitute if she was right. getting paid, but she was hustling. Um, yeah. And there's sex in a lot of it, and I don't think that that was happening at that time where they're showing real, a lot a of skin. Ro- it's a real Roger Corman like Big Bad Mama kind of film. Yeah, for yeah. sure, for sure. And and and, and like you like you said, um, uh, Carradine is the one that kind of said to him like, yeah, like being a hired gun is great, but you really need to do your own thing. And from what I understand, that's what kind of led to this, right? Mean streets. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, speaking of Carradine, he was with uh, Barbara at the time. So that's uh, one of many on scene chemistries that Scorsese as he's casting it. Cause again, it happens in, um, you know, with De Niro and his wife and, and, a later film we'll talk about it but yeah that that kind of stuff I, I i think that he's creating these settings for people this comfortable environment for his actors that if if we look at how many oscar winners he's birthed from his sure. films uh it, it just it's has to, something to do there has to be a scorsese touch to that whole thing and how he creates this comfort zone for them to really take on the character and in in boxcar she does an excellent job Carradine does it like they all he just really lets the characters come to life by giving these people free reign to be something and not read from the page or what the descriptions are and so on. But yeah, mean streets that really, and that's him on, that's him on the pen, you know, not just, uh, you know? Yeah. And, and and, I mean, just a bit of a tie in, uh, Carradine actually has like a bit of a, a a little part in this film. So Mm -hmm. kind of carries over, but, uh, and I quote, you know, mean streets, uh, it was a breakthrough uh, for Scorsese. Was, no, Mean Streets is a breakthrough for Scorsese, De Niro, and Keitel. By now, the signature Scorsese style was in place. Macho posturing, bloody violence, Catholic guilt and redemption, gritty New York locale, though the majority of Mean Streets was shot in Los Angeles, mm. rapid fire editing, and a soundtrack with contemporary music. And yeah. So the, the soundtrack, I mean, if we as music guys, we get into that yeah. first. I don't I really don't know a director that melded his music and his his soundtracks and his films as well as, as Scorsese did, especially, like you said, contemporary style. Maybe yeah. John Hughes, um, because he, I'm, he you know, he did it with all the, the new age music when he was doing sure. all his films. But yeah. like Scorsese did it in the seven in the early 70s. And yeah, this was really the one that kind of sets the tone for uh, the style of, of Martin Scorsese. Yeah. And, and, you know, that, so, it, you know, that he uses the Rolling Stones music a lot. It, mm-hmm. it, 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 it is something it's in mean streets and, you know, it, it's in, it's in Goodfellas. Mm-hmm. Um, so in this film, you know, there, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of Stones music, um, the room, the rumor is, and, and I don't know how true this is, is that half of the film's budget was spent on the music clearances and, and that Francis Ford Coppola, his buddy had some dough and threw him some money at the time. Is that right? I mean, yeah. I did yeah. not know that. I, I, I could see that because, you know, um, it, it, that, that stuff really, that stuff really works. Um, mm. although the film was, it, it, the, although the film was innovative, its weird atmosphere, edgy documentary style, and gritty street level direction owed a debt to directors Cassavetes, Samuel mm-hmm. Fuller, and Jean Luc Godard. You know, mm-hmm. so yeah, I mean, you get it from somewhere. You know, yeah, yeah. you, you got it. Anybody that says they don't is lying. Well, especially Cassavetes, because you know, uh, Mean Streets has um, uh, a lot of handheld stuff. You know, like very, very Cassavetes like hand- mm-hmm. handheld stuff, and of course, this is before the Steadicam, you know, came into play. Not and, until seventy eight. You know, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, and and not just using it, right? Like, because a lot of filmmakers were just like picking up the rig and going out there and doing that. Yeah. But like Scorsese has the forethought and the vision to use it within the characters, right? Yeah. So it's like you know they're paying a little bit closer attention to how st- how well the handheld is going to be used in, in a certain scene for, for instance and then i i think um uh alice doesn't live here anymore talks a little bit about that i forget what it was i think there might have been a uh, 
um, like a commentary. DVD commentary yeah. where about how, you know, her life was so chaotic. Um, but the handheld style, you know, we, comes from Cassavetes, but Scorsese, sure. you know, he definitely gets a lot of credit for that, that style and, and telling the story through the lens. Sure. Uh, another interesting thing is, is, is <clears throat> a lot of Mean Street is set, of course, in his neighborhood in Little Italy. Yep. And, and the church, that the main church where they shot a lot of those scenes was his family's church right there. I believe it's the same church that Vinnie Stigma's grandfather worked on uh, um, the, uh, the stained glass. I think that's the same, the same really? church. That Vinny, yeah, Vinny Stigma's grandfather helped build that particular church. Really? Yeah. yeah. That, uh, apparently, if, if I'm, uh, if, if I got it, uh, if I got it right. I also took a note that, um, this is a personal note, a lot of his tricks come to light with this film. You know, and, and that's like what I said before. And this was my note before. A lot of his tricks, you know, that you see later come to light. And, you know, th there's a slow motion shot in the bar, you know, in, in, in mean streets with Rolling Stones music. That's almost foreshadowing, you know, good fellas. If it's the know? De Niro entrance, it's jumping yeah. Jack flash. Yeah. Yeah. Right. When he's yeah, coming yeah. in and yeah. the, the, the church in little Italy, I, I know, um, cause, uh, my home girl, Lisa Marie, she shot a movie and it's the old St. Patrick's if that's yes. stigmas. Uh, yes. I think so. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, Bob Z three T, uh, this little Italy that we're speaking of is in, is in lower Manhattan. There, there, there is really was a little, a, a little, an, a little Italy or an Italian enclave in Harlem that, that is really at this point, like a couple stores. I mean, it's pretty much gone. Pleasant Ave. Pleasant Ave. Patsy's pizza's up there, right? Yeah. I so think. Pleasant Ave was like always this predominantly Italian area in, in the, right. uh, the east side of Harlem. Um, and now I think Rayo's is probably one of yeah. the most famous spots in that area, but Patsy's pizza, which was yeah. Patsy Grimaldi. Yep. So there is still an Italian section in Harlem, really small. Very, very small. And, and just like uh, up in the Bronx, Arthur Avenue, oh, which yeah. is, which is near where my dad grew up and, and, and he used to take my me mom. there. Yeah. He used to take me there as a kid and, and, you know, Mario's is up there where my dad had his 50th birthday. Um, that, that area is just, you know, getting sort of, you know, you know, Fordham University's right there. They're buying every. It's it's down to like a couple of blocks now. You know. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, the Bronx yeah. has definitely changed since the 1950s. Yeah, uh, Ch you know, this is interesting. Uh, you know, Chucky, Chucky asks. Um, Chucky says, um, you know, why do people hate mean? Why do peeps hate Mean Street so much? Uh, I, I think you know maybe a lot of people are used to seeing a bigger budgeted film that has that much yeah. popularity. So like, yeah. you know, when you look at mean streets, you're not seeing the Godfather. Right. But then you're right. talking about uh, night and day budgets. So again, with the handheld cameras and, and maybe the, the lighting setups aren't as glorious, you know, people think of Martin Scorsese, they, they automatically move to 1990 and above where he was playing with really big money to shoot films. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I think that some people, don't really appreciate cinema unless it's on the the bigger playing field when that comes to like the budget. Is Angela your mom? Angela's my mom. Hi, yep. hi Ms. Capria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, my, my grandfather first lived in the Italian neighborhood in uh, ah, in Harlem. Yeah, right when on. he first yeah. when he first came over here. Got, got gotcha. Um, yeah, so so that that um, you know, I, and I th just commenting on the Mean Streets thing. I know it was hard for me. I can certainly appreciate it now, but as a younger person who's used to a little bit of, of, of like Hollywood filmmaking, Mean Streets was sort of hard for me to wrap my head around. You know, part of it, part of it was um, it's just a very dark film. You know, mm -hmm. it's a very dark film and the characters, you know, the characters are really, you know, really rough, man. You Sorry. know, it, it, yeah. yeah, I mean, when when he's picking up those scripts, and I I forget the movie where, where they him and De Niro it was it might have been Raging Bull where him and De Niro went to the islands to work on the script because they couldn't mm -hmm. find a redeeming value for La Mata, uh -huh. you know, and it's like in these films like that's probably the biggest task is them saying this is so dark and they're so unsettling as characters. Yeah. Where do we have any reason to root for them? Sure. Um, and that's what he's got to go find to make sure that the film works. 
Um, I, I remember, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the Italian series uh, Gamora. Mm-hmm. And, and this is a television series based on a movie that uh, Scorsese ultimately produced called Gamora, also about the, the gangs in, in Naples, the Camorra gangs, okay. on a very, very specific uh, scampia section of Naples, Italy. So they made a television series, one of the greatest crime series I've ever witnessed. And the characterization, the way that the, the writer Fasoli is able to allow you to root for these characters that have no redeeming quality to them <laughs> whatsoever, right. the most vicious killers, they're not doing anything for society, sure. not doing anything for their family, except for earning money. It, it, it's it's a very dark thing to watch. And I don't think a lot of people can can watch that. I don't yeah. think, you know, it's the same reason people don't watch horrors. They're just like, look, I, I don't want to see this stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I got that. Uh, you know, Chucky says, can you elaborate on some of the scenes in Mean Street's filmed in L.A.? Um, y- yeah, I mean, it, it's like like a lot of filmmaking. Uh, you know, a lot of the exteriors are shot in New York, but I, I think I think the majority of the interiors, the bar stuff and all, it's all L.A. Uh, as far as I can, as far as I know, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's um, it's Italy. Uh, Mulberry Street in the Bronx. They did use Mulberry Street. They right. used um, some sections of the Bronx, though. I, I remember that it, w- it was there. But um, the studio stuff that they shot is in California. So yeah. you've got like that's got to um, be the bar stuff. The, the stuff, apart- all the apartment, apartment stuff. Apartment stuff. The bar yeah, all, stuff. All, most of the interiors yeah. that you're seeing, yeah, yeah, they yeah, shot yeah. on a studio location in California, and then they. They, you know, take the exteriors where you have to see certain things sure. and they shoot the street stuff in the streets of New York City. Sure. Um, hold on one second. These guys are fucking outside. Uh-oh. I hope, I hope these guys aren't. I got guys working on the side of my building. I hope they don't start drilling. They were, it's almost like they wait until my show. Like, what time's Drew's show today? <laughs> let's fucking let, 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 let's start. Let's start uh, drilling I, then, you know. I, ha- I had them building a bank downstairs in my new building, and uh, the hammer drilling is, like, intense. Like, it, the it biggest thing. Inter- right they're right here, man. <laughs> um, so let's keep going. So, yeah. you know, based on sort of uh, the, an interesting, you know, I'm, I'm going to put the, this next film up, and then we'll, we'll lend some perspective to it. And that's yeah. uh, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, mm-hmm. which, which – I rewatched with with my girlfriend Rochelle, and I must say, it was really we really enjoyed it. Might have enjoyed it the most of everything we rewatched. Um, just uh, it was a really great film. Um, apparently, um, Ellen Burstyn, who hmm. was really riding high on the, on the success of The Exorcist, she won an Oscar yeah. as best actress for The Exorcist. She basically could write her own ticket. She yep. found this script and she is the one that was recommended. I forgot who recommended her Scorsese, but she took a real chance w- with him uh, on this film. And uh, yep. it's great. I love this film. Yeah. So she, she wins um, back to back, right? Cause it was exorcist. And then she wins for this as well. Um, and there was, yeah, there was talk about that. Uh, and, and I guess in women filmmaking, they should have made a bigger stink about it back then that she put a lot of the pieces to this puzzle together and didn't get producer credit. And, you know, that doesn't happen today. Like, you know, you got guys today it's like, well, if you want me to call so-and-so, you got to put me down as an executive producer. Um, and this woman really, she, she championed and put this whole film together and didn't get right. a producer credit. Huh. You know what, I, what you mentioned that I, I did not realize she won an Oscar for Exorcist and won an Oscar for this. Yeah, I'm not sure about Exorcist. I know she won right. the Oscar for this. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think she was nominated for Exorcist uh, and, okay. and and won, and won for this. But yeah, we really we really enjoyed this film, man. It, it was uh, we, we really did. Um, it's you know they say although this film is well regarded, uh, it remains an anomaly in Scorsese's early career as it focuses on a, a central female character. Yeah. Um, which, you know, yeah, the, it, it's, it's completely off the, the regular path minus the chaoticness uh, uh, yeah. of the film and everything that she's going through. Yeah. Um, and, and for those, I mean, I think knowing this film and if my mom's watching, she'll probably be able to jump in and say something. Cause I, I watched this show Mel's diner. Yeah. Someone, That's Danny right. Marianino. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Mel's That's diner right. comes from this film, which is That's probably right. for any fan of Mel's diner as a That's kid. Right. 
um, you, you have to like watch this film and be like, holy crap, this is the origin right here. And now that would come to saying, should Ellen Bernstein have credit for the Mel's Diner television series? Because, it, you know, it comes off from this whole thing that she put together. I, I, got, I got a trivia question for anybody out there. Um, who is the one actor from Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore who went on to uh, to be in Mel's Diner? Uh, who is that actor that actually was in both films playing the same character? Mm -hmm. That's easy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's easy. If, it's easy if you know you. Should. And he's a he's a great great uh, Hollywood character actor. Yeah, he, he was he was the character. I mean, like just thinking yeah. about it. Yeah, he 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 was great. Um, so so yeah. He, when of, they course, chime in. of course, Danny's Danny. Danny knows it. Yeah, yeah. yeah yep. Vic Tayback, man. And but there's also another piece here that that I forget exactly how it works, and I don't want to get it wrong. But mm -hmm. it's that Diane play, Di, Diane Lad plays Flo in the film. That's and right. Then in Alice. I feel like does she come back as another character or something? There, there's some kind of circular thing that happened oh, yeah? with the TV show later on where she doesn't come back as Flo, but she comes back as another character or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah a couple of people yeah. are chiming in. Yeah, with it's, Vic, it's Vic, Mel. Vic Tayback, who who is just one of the great great '70s character act. You watch any '70s? We watched Pappy on a while back, and fuck, mm -hmm. there's Vic Tayback. You know, like playing a prison guard. You know, he's 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 one of those. Yes, Evan O'Brien, Vic Tayback, uh, 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 absolutely. You know, uh, my own per my own personal notes here uh, about this film. Um, you know, once again, pre steady cam. You know, a lot of the handheld stuff is 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 very Cassavetes like, very herky jerky. And you know, looking at it as a filmmaker, it's like, boy, this guy's just waiting for steady cam to make to to make the scene. Uh, another another great interesting tie in. Is is with this film is that Jodie Foster's in this film? Mm -hmm. she, yeah, she, yeah, and Jodie Jodie Foster is in Alice doesn't live here anymore. She plays like a juvenile delinquent, um, you know. Uh, yeah, real small film. character. Yeah, real small character, and yet she turns up in uh, you Taxi know, in, Driver. Then his next film. Yeah, he cast Same her in his next film. Kaitel. Big, yep. probably one of the bigger, most memorable roles in in yep. this film is Kaitel yep. in the yep. uh, the kitchen scene. I think it is. So Distur disturbing scene, man. Really so Dan, well Dan, done. Scene. Very yeah. well done. Him, he's yeah. just he absolutely grabs you. Um, yeah. and she looked so scared. Like she, her act, yeah. she deserved the Oscar. I mean, she absolutely. really killed absolutely. it. So that Danny used to always, Danny Diablo used to always say something to me about, uh, <laughs> you know people who the in the instigators right because if you know him well enough you know he doesn't go out looking for fights and people just kind of like make stuff happen with him so he would yeah. always say don't poke the bear that was just this whole thing it's just like you know don't poke the bear but i always remembered the kaitel scene where he, he has the scorpion necklace yeah. you know and, and he says to her and he's like if you don't bother it it's not gonna bother you you know like like don't poke the bear and it's, this it's, is me yeah yeah that was just that was a really intense scene man i mean we just watched that like yesterday the day before mm -hmm. and, and like you know we're, you know who's not a big harvey Keitel fan i mean he just turns up in all these films in some like really disturbing role where you know you know and then you know that 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 sort of you know so so um excuse me alice doesn't live here anymore and then and then I guess in between Alice doesn't live here and his next film, he did a, a he did a documentary called Italian American. I About think you family. brought it up before. Could you give us yeah. some perspective on it? Yeah, he he um I mean this is the con the, the consummate storyteller. So he he probably did had some downtime in between. I could see it, you know, maybe some downtime in between deal making and whatever he's yeah. doing. I'm gonna suspect and he and. He told the story of the Italian American through his own family, uh, and this is just a guy with a camera who's going to run interviews and do stuff. And um, yeah, I forget what year it was, but I think that was also another thing that was it was compiled. Seventy five. It was in between both, like seventy, like nineteen seventy five. Yeah, and yeah. and a, co a compilation of of years of work. I'm not sure if he shot that straight through, right? Um, right. But but just a, a guy that's not going to take a break, as we've seen throughout the last, you know. 50, 60 years of filmmaking.
which kind of leads up to this, you know, Boom. which, which, you know, I just rewatched it. And mm. this is a very disturbing film. Very. And uh, really disturbing film. Very. Um, uh, and I quote, already controversial upon its release. Uh, of course, you know, controversial when it came out, but, you know, it hit, it hit the headlines five years later when John Hinckley Jr. made an assassination attempt at then President Ronald Reagan. He subsequently blamed his act uh, on his obsession with Jodie Foster's taxi driver character. Mm -hmm. um, you know, th this, this was a, a very, this was an, this was an, you know, what we kept doing when we watched this film, I kept freezing it. Every New York scene, I would freeze it and go, that's 14th street. That's third Avenue between third. That's that. You know, and even when, even when he's in the diner with, with Sybil Shepard, you, you know, I, I froze it because out the window, I see traffic going both ways. I'm like, that's 14th Street. Yeah, you, you know, a lot it, of 14th it, Street. A lot right. of a lot yeah. of 14th there on the east side. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's such a New York piece. But yeah, so yeah. there. I, I don't want to get that one wrong. But, you know, the whole thing was that potentially the FBI, someone was up for an award uh, right after, years after this film was being made. And then after the Reagan shooting, um, right. there, there was, there was FBI contact or he was being followed like Scorsese. They wanted to like interview him about the film and all that. But I mean, right. even son of Sam, you know, this is, yeah. this is at the time where like Berkowitz and, and if it wasn't just Berkowitz, the son of Sam killings were all coming out like during sure. this time and right after this time. So, you know, that, that mass hysteria yeah. that's happening in the streets of New York city with people that could be this psychotic, you know, he puts yeah. it out on a film for us all to watch. And it's just like, you got probably got half a society or more than half society being like, fuck that thing. And then, you know, filmmaking wise, it's just, it's a masterpiece. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, a couple of things I noticed uh, in the film, um, uh, Joe Spinell, Spinell, my pronounce Joe Spinell, yeah. uh, turns up in this film. Of course, you know, he was Willie Chi Chi in the mm -hmm. other film. We did the show about the Godfather. He was Rocky's, uh, you know, uh, mobster sort of handler in, in Rocky, but Rocky. I, I never noticed that before until, you know, watching it this time. I'm like, oh shit, you know, another great character actor. He was in like, what, Maniac, right? That was a bit, you know, Maniac. So mm -hmm. he, he, Joe, Joe, Joe Spinell turn, turns up in it. Um, Diane Abbott, um, who turns up later, right, in, yep. in King of Comedy. She, yep. She's in it as a porno concession girl. Um, and I want to, I think they were together at the time, though. Uh, is that right? Yeah, is that I think, right? I think De Niro and her were, or they met, maybe they met on that one. That might have been the movie they meet on. I did not know that, but that makes sense. But Victor Argo, he, you know, taxi driver, yeah, he's, yeah. he's, he's in we it, which yeah, yeah. we love working with him. Um, yeah, yeah. Peter Boyle, oh, yeah, yeah. The Wizard. The Wizard. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a a absolutely. And um, what what else? These these, these are my, these are my notes. Um, well, and th and then you know I have. Um, hold on, let me uh, let me get rid of some Scor of Scorsese scene in Taxi Driver. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm getting to that. Yeah, oh, okay. that's, that's, okay. that's what I'm, that's that's what I'm looking for right now. Actually, yeah. Then yeah, then yeah. there's there's this scene that is like in incredibly incredibly disturbing. Right. Uh -huh. I mean, it's a disturbing scene. You know, like he, 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 he gets in the hack and, and, and they go in there. They, that's my wife up there. And, you know, you know, she's in there with a, you know, you know, it, it's, 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 you know, some of this stuff hasn't aged too well, you know, mm -hmm. but you know, it, it was, uh, it's fitting for the times though. It's fitting yeah. for the times. It's so, so De Niro in the, in the, in the car as the hack. I mean, a lot yeah. of people don't know, but you can look online, you could Google it. Taxi driver's license. Uh, he, he worked for a month doing night shifts uh, as a taxi driver in New York city. And I think they were like intensive shifts. They were like really big shifts. And one of the cute stories, I forget where he talked about it, but so he, 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 he was still a relatively unknown dude. So he's working as this taxi cab driver for real to do research for the role. There you go. And um, no one really recognized him. And he just won an Oscar for The Godfather. Wow. And, and here he is just driving. So, But then this actor gets into the car and recognizes him. And it's like, you're Robert De Niro. And he's like, yeah. He goes, he goes wow, you, you just won an Oscar. And he's like, Am I doomed? Is work that hard to find right now? <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's funny. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, so completely yeah, he, this, insane. This, this, this is like folklore, 
like, like this is like folklore amongst filmmakers like you and I and actors. Robert De Niro went out and really got a hack license. Yeah. You know? Yep. And yeah. And he, he, he um, I, f- I forget what he did for the military training part of this whole thing, but um, right. it was also that as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's a, he's a method actor for sure. I think he stayed in character the whole time that they filmed Taxi Driver. Yeah. Here, here's a, here's a couple more shots. Here, here's him and, uh, and Scorsese working together, uh, mm. you know, d- downtown. Um, a young, a young Martin Scorsese. Yeah, uh, young Marty, man. But you know, my, my notes. Let me see. I, I got what else do I have from a tag? Oh yeah. Well, there's this. Oh well, this is. Here's a great one. This, this, uh, on third. This is 13th Street between Second and Third. Um, on that street that you know, you know, if if you know the neighborhood, you you know, anytime I'm like coming back from a Bowery Electric show or the old day seven and I'm driving home and I'm coming up 13th street and I'm stopped at this light. You could see, you know, the, the, the doorway where De Niro walks up to Keitel, you know, again, you know, suck yeah. on this. You yeah. Know, like, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Ah! Yeah. yeah. Uh, hold on. I got to do a, 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 qu- a quick visit. Hold on, hold on. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, yeah. So, so this stuff, you know, I mean, I mean this was disturbing. I mean, Jody Foster playing a, I think a, a 12 or 13 year old prostitute was just, uh, you know, really, th- you know, Pat Baldwin, good call there. Um, let me, uh, do you know, you know, this guy, uh, Stephen Prince is easy. Andy, who, who's the guy who shows him the guns. Yeah. I, I, I definitely recognize him. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of where from, but yeah, I he, definitely recognize he, he, him. No, he did. He did a little documentary about him later on called American Boy. He did a, a documentary about, uh, you know, that's a great scene in Taxi Driver when he's like showing him all the guns and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, re- really, really great. And, and another real, uh, you know, classic, infamous, not infamous, but a classic New York denizen who I saw. Growing up, because I grew up in, in 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 Manhattan for the most part, is, is uh, this guy, which is uh, Gene Palmer, mm-hmm. you know, who was who was a street performer. Yeah, you know, and that's that real Scorsese style of keeping it, you know, just New York. I mean, there's real prostitutes in this movie because yeah. he wanted to include that whole culture. And I believe Harvey Keitel was working with pimps from New York to hold get his his stuff down. I mean, it's just that's the the difference between him and this, you know, I hate to say West coast, but the studio Hollywood made movies that were coming out and that's what really segregated Scorsese. And now it allowed the independent filmmakers to say, wait a minute, if they're going to make a film about Bama, we should really show them Alabama. And you know, it it just really, you know, that was his edge was that he was just going to keep it real. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, taxi driver, urban decay era. Absolutely. I mean, taxi driver, you know, came out in 76. It was probably shot in, you know, 74, you know, uh, New York was really at, at, at its absolute low point. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, you know, back, back then, uh, here's one of these sort of urban, what do they call these, uh, urban gorilla, whatever they call it, like where they match up the, you know, uh, this Columbus is the circle. Yeah. Columbus circle. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 There he is standing right there, 75, uh, 2000, 2013. Um, what else? Do I got any other taxi driver stuff? Well, yeah. Well, the, that, that, the reception. We were talking about, you know, how, how people looked at this in cans. Uh, I believe that, you know, it gets they booted, out. Right? They booed it, but the New Yorkers that were there for Scorsese kind of overpower that. But a lot of people booed this film on its first, right. you know, view. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this this film was pretty – This this film – you know, it was, was pretty punk rock in a lot of ways, you know? It was, uh, on, on the musical tip, it was uh, Bernard Herrmann's final uh, scoring was for this film. Are you, are you, was, that, was that sort of like the haunting uh, sax stuff? Yeah, he, yeah. and, and, and uh, it's, it's, I forget what it was, but it was some kind of like eerie, I think it was like some eerie death sound that Scorsese wanted. It was like his last phone call with him was like, hey, I need you to create this, this eerie death thing. And then like the guy dies like three weeks later. And, and, and that's all, all throughout the film is that theme, that taxi driver thing. It's like, it comes up literally 20 times and like in the film constantly. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. Um, Pat says the movie's honesty is timeless. 
because it's not didactic and doesn't peddle a message. Yeah, I mean, it definitely is. I mean, you, you're watching a movie about someone going through severe psychosis. So, you know, you go and, and I say the same thing for King of Comedy. That, yeah. that movie is timeless, you know, even though it yeah. really has this like 80s, 70s, you know, television feel, feel to sure. it. But it's, sure. it's very timeless. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. And, and just looking at my notes, like, you know, in, 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 a, in a couple ways, you know, my, my note is another De Niro role is a creep. You know, yeah. there's a couple really uncomfortable scenes in, in, in Taxi Driver where, you know, there's that one scene where um, him and um, uh, what, what's her name? Um, Silver uh, Shepherd. Thank you. Uh, here's a cool shot, just real quick. Here's, I guess, the cast reunited for a screening uh, a couple years ago. Oh, amazing. You know? Yeah. Amazing. There's Sybil Shepard, uh, Scorsese, De Niro, Jodie Foster, and Harvey Keitel, you know? There, um, there was a little rumor that when they were casting the film, they were saying, um, we're looking for a Sybil Shepard type. Uh, so her manager got wind of that and called up and was like, how about Sybil Shepard? <laughs> is that right? Yeah. Yep. Yep. I mean, I, I gotta say, I got, I gotta say this about Sybil Shepherd in the film. She's staggeringly beautiful in the film. Yeah. I mean, just staggeringly beautiful. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah. And um, so yeah, but but there's a couple, there's these couple of scenes where where De Niro is just it's just really it's just really uncomfortable, and and, and you know I don't know how well that stuff has aged you know it's like he's playing a really mentally ill person and i feel like re-watching some of these films and, and you mentioned king of comedy we'll get to that I, i'm not sure if some of this stuff in some regards has has sort of aged well in, in the regard that um watching it in today's sort of um framework you know uh, some of the characters are, are it's really, it's really, really difficult. You know? I mean, that's how he shoots. Right. So like, yeah. you know, it's, it's hard to watch. And I think maybe, yeah. you know, us seeing it as we're getting older, it's even harder to watch because it's yeah. so, un, it's so unsettling, you know, these yeah. characters. Yeah. 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 Um, well, the it's... other, the other thing about the film that I remembered, uh, and it has to do again with that Oscar and his fame is that when he signed on to do this with Scorsese, it was a $35,000 coupon to do it. And then he won the Oscar and everyone was scrambling thinking, oh, this guy's going to buck and not work and he's going to ask for more money. But De Niro said, no, I'm going to hold honorable to the contract that I did and I'm doing the film for the same amount. Is that right? He won the Oscar for playing young Don Corleone? Yeah. Right yeah, before, before Right before, before filming started. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, well, you and I, you know, we did a whole show about Godfather and boy, he deserved it. He was so fantastic in that film. Yeah, you know? there's 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 that instance, and there might be another where a character, two characters, uh, two actors win the Oscar for playing the same character. So you yeah. had Brando win it for the first one playing right. Don Corleone, and then That's he right. won it for Don Corleone. Yeah. Now the, the next up in the canon is this film, which in a way is like it's like a real anomaly. Um, you know, New York, New York. I I have never seen this film. I couldn't watch it because it's not available. Um, it's I, you know, I was really looking forward to watching it as part of the show, but I couldn't see it. Have you seen it? I saw it a very long time ago, and you know, didn't love it when I had to hate to say that about a Scorsese film, but didn't love it when I saw it back then. Probably because if you're looking for a Scorsese film, you're looking for some type of violent right. intensity, and and yeah. although he's done a lot of dramas, and I know he has a great love for music. I just remember being younger and not really loving the film. And I, yeah. I don't know if I'm the, I'm the masses, but it also bombed yeah. at the box office, which, which put him into uh, yeah. a, a, not a depression, but um, it, it definitely messed with him. I think that, you know, he admitted in, in later interviews sure. um, that he was, uh, that he was having a lot of problems with, with drug use and, and, right. and probably what we would label now as anxiety. Uh, he yeah. actually was, he was checked into a hospital uh, after this film had done so bad. Um, yeah. And I, I don't know if we're queuing up for the next film. Well, well I, I, we are. Stay on it, yeah. Yeah, but but th there was a couple of things in between where you talked about this sort of dark period. Yeah. And 
one thing that I think contributed to it was he directed a Broadway musical starring Liza Minnelli, Minnelli called The Act, and it was a bomb. And so the dis the disappointing reception apparently really drove you know f drove him into a cocaine addiction. Yeah. Um, and you know he sort of roamed roamed the wasteland uh, a bit. Uh, of course, you know, he or, you know he already connect you know, and then he sort of came into this. And this this sort of sparked his relationship with Robbie Robertson, you know. Mm -hmm. that, you know, the, listen, th this this documentary Last Wall Waltz just oozes cocaine. Mm -hmm. You know, like you, you watch this film, Rick Danko, Rob. You, you this film, you know. I, I think there's a scene. I think they actually. I think that they um, in later in later versions when Neil Young is on stage performing, originally he had a, a huge cocaine booger in his nose. And I think in later they versions edited of it out. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, I mean, this film, of course, you know, I, you know, there's a lot of great stuff in this film. I'm a big fan of, of this film. Some of the sequences in this film, you know, are, are, are incredible. But, um, you know, this was, uh, yeah, the, the, the muddy waters. There's so much going on with this film. But I think this was just sort of part of his, uh, you know, his dark period. And then, uh, interestingly enough, he did that American Boy documentary. And then this this is something I never knew. He shot footage and was an editor on Elvis on tour. Mm -hmm. Working, staying working. working. Guy can't sit still. Staying working. And yeah. then apparently, Robert De Niro saved his life when he persuaded him to kick his addiction and make this film, this masterpiece. Yeah. yeah. Raging Bull. Yeah. Yeah. So, Your take? yeah, I mean, it, it is it is an absolute masterpiece that had a lot of hurdles. He's up against other boxing films that are coming out and he didn't want to do a sports movie. And yeah, so it was De Niro that I think came to him a few times saying that he had this book by Jake LaMotta and Scorsese didn't want to hear it. And I think he was in a hospital or something when he finally came to him. It's like, you, you know, you you're going to make your comeback and it's going to be with me and it's going to be with this book. And uh, that's when they started on the the journey to make, you know, one of the greatest films in cinema history, to be honest. Yeah. yeah um, really incredible. Yeah. 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 Another based on a book where he, this guy takes, you know, it's not easy, man. It's not easy to read a book and, and, and take it and turn it into a movie. Not every book is a movie and, and uh, trans uh, which is, which is just, excuse me, which is what's known for everybody out there that may not know. You know, the Oscar goes to uh, best uh, screenplay ad adapted screenplay when you right. when you take a book and you adapt a screenplay. And then the other award is for just best screenplay. original. Original, yeah, screenplay. best original screenplay. Original yeah. Screenplay. Right. Right. Yeah. Yes. So so this was um also uh, I don't know. If th this is Mardik Martin. This is Paul Schrader. This is a bunch of his favorite writers and him yeah. and uh, um, jumping in. I think I'm not sure what Mardik was with him in college as well. But I know that those those two love jumping up uh, together. And um, yeah, the Oscar for De Niro, you know, and, and uh, it, it was, um, I think Thelma, she, she, she probably also as an editor won the Oscar for this one. But the decisions were always, I don't think he was ever definitive on the decision to shoot this in black and white. And that's always mm. been a question. It's like, why? Um, there were a lot of different things you know, mm -hmm. they said maybe not to compete with Rocky and the other sports films that were out there right. to right. show it in the era. Um, and, and it's just one of those things. I don't think he ever like clearly said why, but it obviously worked. You know, it worked, yeah. it worked very yeah. well. It, 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 yeah, this was this was a, a very uh, intense, disturbing film. Um, kamikaze method of filmmaking, um, you know, insecure males, violence, guilt and redemption. Uh, and these are my notes. First mm. master, first masterpiece, black and white, a much lauded film. Um, you know, just a couple of the scenes that really, the scene where Jake LaMotta, Robert Dino is talking to her through the fence at the pool. I just thought it was just incredibly great filmmaking. And and then I have a note about uh, the home movies montage that's in it when, when, when he marries her and there's like this eight millimeter home movie montage. I yeah. thought it was just really great. Really, really great no, filmmaking not shot by him is that right yeah so so they they tried a, a few attempts at making those films and they didn't like the way that it felt 
And he's like, the problem is we're trying to make films. So they asked some guys, some union shooters, to just go out and shoot the footage so it would have a more home feel to it. And 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 that's the only stuff that he didn't shoot for the film. Yeah. Um, yeah, little fun facts. I, I love it. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the, the blood, um, when they were looking for things to use, they did like a test shot and they found out that Hershey's syrup was That's just right. a richer looking right. blood in the black and white film. So they actually used chocolate syrup for the blood shots. Um, yeah, and and he right. needed all that blood because when he first started going to the boxing gyms and checking, because all he remembered was like blood on cloth, blood spurts and stuff. And sure. he's like, wow, this is, we got to be able to show this type of violence that these guys are doing to one another. Um, yeah. Cause this is truly violent film. I mean, and, 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 and honest because Jake LaMotta, you know, he, he watches this film and you would think, and I know ego can really come into play and he could get mad at a guy like Scorsese, even though he wrote the book and he was honest within his book, but like Scorsese has a chance to portray him the way he sees him. And, yeah. and LaMotta was, you know, I, I heard in tears, like, was I really this horrible of a person? He even asked Vicky, his wife, and she was like, you were worse, Jake. Yeah. You know? A really, really, really incredible film. And, yeah, it, it just and, and I remember um, at the time when it came out, um, just how much attention and, and it was put on the fact that those fight scenes, what went into shooting those fight scenes? All single camera. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. He, he said yeah. that he wanted to create the camera as the third opponent in the fight That's scenes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very those, difficult. Fight, those very fight difficult. Scenes. And, 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 and what's incredible about watching some of these films, this one in particular is the technology didn't exist then. So, you know, he, he's really shooting this stuff, the old, you know, the old fashioned way, you know, the, the real, you know, meat and potatoes filmmaking, man, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, Evan O'Brien asks, was this the first Pesci De Niro pairing? Yes. Yeah. So there's a great story behind this. I don't want to get it wrong. Peter Conti told it to me, uh, who, who was very close friends with, um, with with uh, Pesci, um, and it was it was that De Niro had known about him and Frank Vincent because they were they were uh, running clubs and doing you know per performance based stuff. But there was a club in the Bronx that Pesci was running, and he called he got the phone number to the place because he wanted he's like this guy could be in a movie with me. So he he calls up. Sorry, Bailey's kind of kind of tripping. He's just it's okay. Yeah. So he he calls up and he says, you know. Um, please have Joe call me. It's, it's Robert De Niro. So the guy that the head waiter or whatever says, Hey, Robert De Niro call for you. Here's his phone number. And he like crumples it up, throws it in the garbage. He's like, get the fuck out of here. Don't bother me. You know, typical Pesci. And then the guy says, the guy called again. Here's the phone number. And he, he throws it out again. He goes, don't fuck around. We ain't got time for shit. Fuck Robert De Niro. Next time he calls you, tell him I said, go fuck himself or whatever. <laughs> and, and then finally says to him, you know, Robert De Niro's asking for you. He's trying to get in touch with you. So uh, he, he finally takes the call with him. Couldn't believe that he's calling him to do this movie. And then Pesci brings on Frank Vincent. Uh, they had someone, I think, casted for the Frank Vincent's role. But right. Pesci and him were really close. And he knew he could have a more street New York feel for that type of character. And I, I also believe that Pesci brought Moriarty uh, in. who This was Kath, her. Kath, she, Kath, Kathy Moriarty. Who was yeah. very, very young. I think she was like a teenager, right? Yeah, she was a teenager at the time. She played, she was like 18, 19 at the time, but supposed to be playing a 14-year-old true yeah, to life yeah, of when Lamada yeah. met Vicky. Um, yeah. and, and there was a lot of people that auditioned for that role and, and didn't get it. It was um, I think one of the big ones was Michelle Pfeiffer. And wow. and Moriarty had never done a film before, but she was wow. so strikingly beautiful uh, that that they cast her in it to give her that real. She was, and I think she's Bronx native as well, so yeah. you know it really captured it. Uh, the essence again, Scorsese of using true to the roots people to play people that he's you know trying to uh, show in filmmaking and and not caricatures like a lot yeah. of these Hollywood filmmakers do. You know, um, one of the things is that we talked about this being shot in black and white. And, yep. and one note I have, we just really, really enjoyed and loved the wardrobe design and and this and and the set design and 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 the and the wardrobe stuff. Just really, really, just you know, every scene was like, yo, I love his shoes. I, I you know, I, I love the shirt he's wearing. You know, just really, really done, done, done very well. Yeah. Yeah, his yeah. his whole team is just you know through the roof amazing, and I know we'll get into it later. But you know yeah. that's that's the team that really put Boardwalk Empire together uh, with yeah. Scorsese's whole crew. Yeah, yeah. You know, let me let me ask you. I, I know you know you know a lot of this. Uh, 
was Joe Pesci acting at this point when he had a club? Was was he trying to break in as an actor? I know he was a singer. So you know, back then in in the in the lounge days, you know, they had the and that's what La Lamada wanted to go. It's funny that you know Lamada goes to that in Miami to be this lounge host. Right. You know, so Pesci was running a nightclub, and and yeah, he's doing. I think he really wanted to be a singer. I don't think he was thinking like, I'm going to have an acting career, but right. they're doing stand up. They're doing bits, you know, and in between their bits, they get to play some original songs and, and him and Frank Vincent were, were a duo back then. And just, if you look no, online, I did not, I did not know that. So oh, yeah, Joe Pesci and Frank Vincent were a singing duo. They were a duo. I would say more doing the bits and stuff. Like they would do right. the performances. I, I might have, cause I, I did a music video back like 23 years ago with Frank Vincent, with G fella. And um, he, he, uh, he was just a great guy. I mean, like the guy was in character all the time. Uh, you you, you met Frank Vincent? Yeah, I, I directed him in a music video. Ah. Yeah. Oh, that's so, right, that's right. I, I, I know that, right. So, yeah. so, you know, at that time I was probably like early twenties, you know, trying to be a filmmaker. And this guy's already done all these great movies and he's sitting in the trailer. We got a trailer for him. I go on the trailer and my friend's like, Hey Frank, you know, I'm introducing you to, to Don Caprio. He's the director of the music video. And Frank Vincent just looks at me and goes to his friend, that guy's the director. He doesn't look like he could direct traffic. And it was just, that was it. It was just ball breaker mode the entire time we did the music video. Great guy, rest in peace. And I, I grew uh, to have a relationship with his manager and Pesci's manager, Melissa Prophet, who still manages uh, Pesci. Um, but those two were best of best of buddies and wow. they were doing nightclubs together. Yeah. Wow. Uh, your mom says he helped make Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons who they Joe are. Joe Pesci. Yeah, Joe Pesci. Right. Yeah, he put yeah. those guys on. They they have that character in the Clint Eastwood directed film. Um, what was the big movie that they turned into uh, a Broadway play? Um, oh, broad, broad, um, uh, Broadway Boys. What was it called? Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Not but Broadway that, Boys. Uh, something like that. Something the very. Story close of Frankie Val. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah but that was Pesci. Danny says. They had to, uh, they had to beg a uh, Jersey boys. They had to beg Jersey. Pesci to do Raging Bull. De Niro went to him a half a dozen times. I, I think people had asked him, and he said no. And it was De Niro that finally got him to do it. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Jersey yeah. boys. Yeah. So I mean, so so that film was just an incredible tour de force, um, you know, for for, for Scorsese as, as a director. And I think you know after that. Uh, he was, you know, he was really kind of able to to write his own ticket, um, you know. Um, after yeah, I mean, the, how many how many films do you have to direct? Yeah, where you have your lead actors winning Oscars before they call you an Oscar maker, you know, yeah. and, and that's yeah. just that one was just another one, another nail in the coffin when De Niro wins. So the film he did after this is interesting, and and just watch this. This is. That's the king of comedy, you know. Yeah. Um, really. No laughing matter. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, a, a film that I held in very high regard. Um, I, I remember it being great, and upon watching it again, you know, I found it, you know, once really disturbing. It's very um, disturbing. You, you know, part, I think part, you're getting older. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think part of I think part of the dis what made it so disturbing for me is seeing it back then. It was sort of, I thought it was a funnier film. This time around, it was more disturbing because in a way, it's, to me, it was almost like a commentary. In, well, of course, it's a commentary on what how far people will go for stardom. And it, it really, ref, this is a timely film now because it really reflects the world we live in now. With, yeah. fuck, with, 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 with Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and 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 you know, the Kardashians and what I thought was very funny and quirky before was just very sort of, you know, was just very, you know, very creepy. It's, uh, it's one of the most unsettling Scorsese yeah. films. And it's yeah. also the one of the most underrated Scorsese yeah. films for me. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, to fast forward 2019, the Joker ripped everything from this film like front to yeah. back and no, no just no disrespect because they did an amazing job with the film but 100%. like everything they got came from king of comedy absolutely yeah absolutely yeah and and i thought the joke i thought the joker was a very disturbing film 
Very. You know, I, I, yeah. it was very, very disturbing film. Um, but, uh, you know, I, 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 we went into this. I was excited. You, you, listen, you know, you know, two words about this film. Jerry Lewis. I oh, mean, yeah. he is so fantastic in this film. Um, you know, playing the role of Johnny Carson. Yep. You know, yes, yes. He, it was, it was, it was modeled. Um, I think the script was originally modeled. Um, Paul D. Zimmerman was writing it, thinking of Dick Cavett. Is that right? Yeah, but then you know Johnny Carson immediately is what comes to mind for all, this. especially the Ed McMahon reference and all that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. The, the, the guy never took credit for it. Jerry Lewis was always very humble about it. He just said, look, I just, I was playing myself, you know, he but was he, great. Really, he was really amazing. Uh, he, he, the show stealer he, for me is, is uh, Sandra Bernhardt. Really? Uh, she is just flawless front to back in this movie. Sorry. I mean, yeah. the, 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 the scenes with her in the Upper East Side apartment with the candles lit and, yeah, and yeah. like yeah. that is like a page from Misery. Like she really had you like, wow, this woman is absolutely effing crazy. Yeah, yeah I, guess, I guess that's why I, I guess that scene in particular, like you said, looking at it as a younger person, I thought it was very humorous and very funny. Watching it through the uh, my eyes now, it super was super disturbing. Super disturbing. Yeah, it, it, it was. It was. It, it was really disturbing. You you know, I think just personally, like I I have a hard time with things like like the show hoarders and things like that. I don't like to. I don't find men, uh, mentally ill people as entertainment it's it, especially it, in the spotlight you know yeah like like it's yeah. just it's sad it's it's you you feel yeah. for him and you you know you see him when he gets to the 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 vacation house and and like he's sitting there with the butler and like it's yeah. just a and he has the girlfriend that he had the crush on from high school it's like it's so yeah. sad you're watching this guy and you know i mean even at the end it's like the fbi sitting there and and like he's just like yeah take me away i got what i wanted this is all i wanted i wanted my moment of fame you know um, yeah, and, and and it's and and it's and it, when that film came out, there were not a lot of instances of demented stalkers tracking down celebrities and killing them, yeah. which which happened has happened many times since then. I think in, in, in the way I don't want to call the film naive, but but in, in a way, you, you know, the film you know said almost like this could happen or, or, or this there's, this is a scenario, you know, and after that there, there's been horrible instances of people that suffer from mental illness, you know, tracking down celebrities like the way they did with Jerry Lewis in the film and, and, and doing very similar things and going as far as killing them. So yeah, yeah, yeah. very, you know, another really interesting thing about this film that, that, and it's a little tie in with, with, with our show here is that, um, Members of the Clash were in the film at the phone booth. Yeah, this yeah. is a great scene. Yep. Um, you know, in Times Square. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, here's Scorsese uh, yep. talking to. That's Joe Strummer on the left. I think that might be Ellen Foley in the middle. That's that's uh, uh, my my friend and neighbor Cosimo Vinyl in the middle, and then and then um, uh, Mick Jones. And I shot this. I, I took this screenshot during during the film, uh, you know, when they're when they're in, you know this is from the actual film, and there's Mick Jones on the right and Cosmo right there, and and they turn up in the King of Comedy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's just Scorsese keeping it real, you know. Yeah. Um, the, he's a music lover, and he got a chance to throw him in there, and uh, yeah, pretty pretty awesome cameo, pretty awesome. Uh, Lori says, I read he wanted The Clash to write a score for him, but Joe Strummer passed before they had a chance to. Oh, uh, wow. you, you know, so I watched this film, right? And and I saw this scene. And Cosmo Vinyl, who was The Clash's road manager, uh, is a guy, he, he's, he's a guy that's been on my radar screen a long time. And uh, ever since I was a teenager, he was like the fifth member of The Clash. And he lives in my neighborhood. And af after I saw this, I reached out to him about coming on the show. And oh, shoot. Uh, he was very kind. Um, he was very kind. But he just said, I don't, do th I, I don't do things like that these days. Thank you so much for the kind words. 
if I ever do, you know, you'll be the first one, you know, that I think of. But awesome. uh, I was like, awesome. I got to get Cosmo Vinyl on the show. You know? Awesome. So, uh, so yeah. So, so that said, but um, yeah, that, that, let me see. Looking at my notes, um, Rupert Pupkin, a lot like Travis Bickle. Uh, yeah. A demented outsider who was inappropriate with women, delusional. This film is not as funny as I remember it. The clash, <laughs> the clash in the Times Square scene. Um, this film hasn't aged well. Too much of this has come true. It's a bit of a scary movie, a cautionary tale of how far people will go for stardom. And then, you, you know, 2019, Arthur Flick playing the Joker. And, and right. uh, they actually right. cast De Niro to play Murray Franklin, which is the Jerry Lewis character. That's right. Um, and they yeah. just make it fatal. You know, yeah. that's that's yeah. the, the, the That was a fucking disturbing, disturbing, dis disturbing scene. Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, so after after King of Comedy, uh, he uh, Scorsese directed an episode of Amazing Stories, which was uh, Steven Spielberg's uh, series there. And then. He directed this film, which which was which was you know a little confusing to me at the time uh, why he would be doing why he did this film, um, mm -hmm. which is After Hours. Uh, it seemed like sort of like a compromise or a low budget film. A any perspective on this? Yeah, I'm I'm not sure if this the the books or the scripts weren't out there. You know, it's hard to see like what's in their filmmaking process. I don't know if versatility comes into play, um, and if he's got something that he's lining up future in the future. But it it seems like in the '80s, you know, he he wasn't making the same film, which was interesting. You know, yeah. Um, and and I I think that that's where you really tip your hat to him as a director because it shows his range. You know. Yeah. Um, but definitely not a, not a choice that you would think as his manager to say, hey, you know, you got to you got to make this film now. And it's just again, it just lends to his whole versatility. Yeah. A um, couple people chiming in, uh, chiming in. Um, I love After Hours. Hilarious. You know, it, it was it was interesting. Um, I like how it was shot. It, it's a very it, it's a, it's a it's a roller coaster ride. Um, I also did recognize um, a friend of ours who was who has been a guest on the show. There's a scene uh, in the club when they go in, and uh, Bobby Steele from the Undead is mm. is in the scene along with this guy here. I don't know who this is wearing the A7 shirt, but that's Bobby Steele who, who's been on the show. Um, is 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 in the scene where where he goes. He goes into, uh, you know, he, he, he goes into uh, the, the, uh, the kudos club. kudos to the wardrobe person for getting that A7 shirt to stay it, it, in the film there. Yeah, there you go. Um, uh, one of my notes is diner scene. He mm. likes to shoot in diners. He does. It's a great. Yeah. A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff is said in diners. It's just, yeah. You know, yeah. Very good yeah. locations. And I'm sure as a writer, he spent a lot of time in diners. And then another note I have is about the off. There's an office scene uh, where 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 it's, he's like uh, you know dolling around the desks and all that. And 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 my note is foreshadows Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, I, yeah, stylistically, yeah, yeah, that, it, yeah, it does. Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He he's he's telling a lot of the same stories. There's a lot of the similar characters. You know, he's always in the he's in the crime thriller. You know, he did sports because uh, even if you consider color of money that's considered sports right because yeah. it's, it's pool sharks yeah. um but he stays in a lot of the same spaces which allows him to spill over into another film that kind of comes from or is given birth to from a film he's already done yeah and like i said um watching them in succession the way i just did you see certain patterns develop you know uh which is really interesting which is something you know you just don't see unless you watch them back to back to back you know you're not gonna you know, I watched seven of his films in, 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 in seven days. So, you know, a lot of interesting, interesting stuff comes up like, oh, wow. Oh, th this scene. OK, this is one of his tricks. This is in this is in his toolbox. OK. Yeah, I, I, I get it. And listen, I'm sure you can relate. I, I do. You know, I do the same thing as a filmmaker. It's like, you know, I, I, I do. The, I'm like, you know, let, let's you know, I know that this is tried and true and this works. You know, let's let's try this. I did this in this music video. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, the scene of Freddie Madball sitting on the chair 
in the um, Pride video that I did in 1996 is basically verbatim the same scene that Scott Roberts is sitting on the park bench in Tompkins Square Park for the take video that I did a couple years ago. Right. Right. It's, yeah. It's, it's in my toolbox. Yep. You know? Yep. Yeah. It's in, there's an energy there that, you know, someone else can perform and bring to the table in a different light. That's still going to work. Yeah. Cause it sits within a, a system. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, let me, uh, let me take a, a sponsor break for a couple minutes and yeah. we'll come back and we'll get into, uh, the Michael Jackson bad video, Last Temptation of Christ and Goodfellas, all right? Gotcha. I'll see you in a couple minutes. All right. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Uh, our guest today is Don Caprio, and we're talking about Martin Scorsese's early uh, film career. And uh, let's take a word from our sponsor. Since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as t-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections of music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area? Call! or email generationrecords at gmail.com and follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Hey, guys, Vlad from Organic Grill. As you can see, we're in a new location on West 3rd Street, right by Blue Note and Comedy Cell. The place is bigger, kitchen is bigger, we have more varieties, more food. We are looking forward to treat you guys with great dishes. All Hardcore Chronicles, welcome to, to Organic Grill. We are going to serve all the events as we usually do. And we are happy to see you guys. Peace, what it do? Welcome to NYT Comics at 117 Main Street, Dob, Surrey, New York. I'm Debo the Pro with my homie. Me Farley. Welcome to the spot. Specializing in yesterday's and today's comic books, rare CGCs, toys, collectibles. Got skateboards, old school tapes, Magic the Gathering, Warhammer. Video games, original art, original art pieces by your favorite New York City and worldwide artists. Let's go! Skate decks all day, baby! We also have the young reader section here for like 10, 10 and under. Uh, the pops, people love the pops. Star Wars! Star Wars. We are New York Hardcore. We always rep the scene. Let's get it on. And we're back. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Our guest today, Don Caprio, fellow filmmaker, talking about what we love, film. It is a Martin Scorsese retrospective. First part of what I think is going to be three. It's gonna, this might have to be three three parts. Um, Want to mention uh, some upcoming shows. Uh, this Sunday, Dave Tree from Tree will be on the show. A week from today, John, speaking of New, great New York characters, Johnny Paisano will be on a week from today. Wednesday, August 30th, Kevin Sharp from Brutal Truth. This is a show we haven't announced yet. This is the New Music Spotlight on Sunday, September 10th. And this show is live. I'm, I'm doing this live from Bridge Nine Records. Hey, you know what? If you got some new music coming out, your band, something you want to give a push, reach out. We like to march a lot of people through these shows and give as many people a uh, shine as possible. So new music spotlight, Sunday, September 10th. Uh, Sunday, October 1st, Shane from Napalm Beth talking about his his book, Ill Bill, is October 4th. And Trevor Moment from American Werewolves is Sunday, October 15th. So lots of great shows coming up. Also, please want to mention, support the show. I uh, want to uh, mention our latest patrons, uh, Camille Paradise and Nerd Cage Live. The show needs your support. 
even if you've uh, been a, a patron in the past and you sort of wandered off, please come back. The show only survives because of your support. Uh, please. There's a Patreon page there, a couple of tiers. Um, the new book, the new book will be out uh, probably about October 1st. This is the first one. The second one's coming out and it is free to all patrons. So join Patreon and get down. There's also a PayPal address there. If you want to make a contribution, there's a super chat function that you could do as well. Uh, also want to mention, uh, I'm going to be down in uh, Greenville, South Carolina, screening my new film on August 27th, The Jews in the Blues, uh, Sunday matinee with school drugs, September 3rd, the Dick Dynamite screening at the Nighthawk Cinema. I will be moderating uh, is Thursday, uh, the September 7th, uh, incendiary device. And thank you for all the, uh, the best wishes regarding us signing to bridge nine. We will be playing the bridge nine warehouse. It's sold out in the half hour playing with H2O. If you got tickets, great. Uh, Saturday, the 9th, uh, the 30th of September we're playing dingbats with uh, spoiler NYC, the take ice cold killers and frequency overload. And we just announced this yesterday we are, we are dusting it off. We are revving up the old machinery. The Drew Stone Hit Squad with Kristen, uh, Tristan DeGraves, Mike Flattery, and Aaron Collins from Butterbrain uh, are in the band now as well. That said, I think we covered a lot. Uh, yes, school drugs. Come on down. Big show. We we're excited. School drugs is playing the Bowery Electric. With non-residents, fire is murder, cartel, and dragons at noon. That said, let us bring our guest back on, Mr. Don Cacchio. Amen. What's going on? Hey, hey. Um, let me see. Did I skip any pictures? Color money. Uh, is that what's color? No. Uh, Michael Jackson bad music video. So what came first? Because I wonder which one came first. Was it color of money or was it was it bad? It could be either or. It could be either or. You 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 wanna you wanna do color of money first? Well, yeah. So color of money. Um, I'm thinking. It. I'm trying to put the the timeline together. Let me see because one of the cool things about the two of these together is that um, the adaptation, the screenwriter for color of money, uh, also wrote the script. For bad, the music is that video. right? Yeah, yeah. I did so, not know that. Yeah, so that was the um, that's the kind of tie-in with the two of these. It was Richard Price that had had worked on both these with Scorsese. I see. Um, you know, one of the coolest things that come out of this film for me uh, early on, if any of you are fans of Tom Cruise, is mm -hmm. that you know he did all of these trick shots. I think there was only like one trick shot the guy didn't do in the movie. And that's because Scorsese was like, we can't afford you to go practice for another two days. Cause he was so insane. Even back then at making sure that he did everything just like he is with his stunts and MI and all that. Yeah. So, you know, seeing a Tom Cruise movie early, you just think it's Hollywood, but then you're like, wait a minute, this is him in every single thing that he's doing. And he did it in every single film he ever made, which was wow, pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. I I, um, I, did, I I didn't really know that, that he did all, all, all his shots. Yeah. He did all the shot. I think there was one, I think it's the pool ball hopping shot that he didn't wow. have, but all the rest of the trick shots in the film. So don't, if you ever catch Tom Cruise in a bar, do not challenge him to uh, a game of pool. He's going to yeah. wipe, wipe the table with you. Have, have um, you, Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say then, you know, the other thing about this film that I loved is that this was the movie that Newman finally wins an Oscar. That's and, right. and, and the guy was nominated like nine or 11 times. Can you Something believe totally it? Totally crazy. And, and while this is a really amazing film and he did an amazing job in it, I could think of six others he should have won for, you know. This, I, I remember, and I remember when he won, it was sort of like, you know, they, they gave, it was like, a gimme. We, yeah, it was a yeah. gift, like you know, and that happens. That happens in 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 the in the Academy Awards a lot. It's yep. like they reflect and go, "Wow, this guy, you know, we gotta we gotta give this to him." Even though the role that he's doing in the moment doesn't even compare to the stuff that the guy did, you know, in the past that they passed oh. him for. Yeah, um, another you cool, know, just just like the Clash. Please. There's a there's an Iggy Pop cameo in here um so I, it's it's you know scorsese again keeping with his his music folks um and and like making sure that they get like a little part in the film and that was that was kind of cool 
Um, I have a I have a uh, a personal uh, family connection to this film. Really? Yeah. Tell so me, tell me. this film is re- basically the sequel to the Hustler. To the Hustler. Yep. Right. And uh, the Hustler with with Paul with Paul Newman. Paul Newman. Yep. My and that uncle, one with Jack with Jackie Gleason. Oh, I love that. Who, who they, I'm a big, they, I'm a big they tried, Jackie Gleason fan, man. They tried figuring out getting him in it, and it, it just didn't it didn't happen. What to get Jackie in it? Yeah, they, I forget what was going on. They wanted to create the character again at some point, and uh, right. I, I forget exactly what it was. But yeah, it's the follow yeah. up to the Hustler. Same writer, same book. Right. So um, my uncle, uh, my uncle Richie Richard Stone, uh, was a film editor, and when he was coming up. He was uh, a, an assistant under an editor named Dee Dee Allen. And uh, Dee Dee Allen uh, was the editor on The Hustler. And my Uncle Richie was an assistant editor on The Hustler. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. I, I have a little bit of a family connection. And, you know, that and, 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 and my Uncle Richie always, you know, bring, you know, that was sort of like, you know, you, you, you know, the, the way you know, that, that was his. That's a big, a big feather in the cap. You know, he 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 worked on the Hustler, and uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, it's a great film. You know, I remember when this film came out. You know, with the Eric Clapton sounds. You know, Eric Clapton video. A lot of a lot of good music. A lot yeah. of good music. Yeah. But I remember feeling a little disappointed, like being like the Hustler was such a gritty sort of uh, like street level film. This was a very Hollywood feeling film. I thought. It, it it definitely didn't have the same. It did, also, it, it lacked some of that Scorsese grit. Yes, that's that right. you, you were used to seeing. You know, yeah. there 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 was you know confrontational scenes in the pool halls, the fighting scenes. Yeah, the, yeah. You know the di- You know, but it, it, it also was really the depiction of of you know that that character and how dark the world and his life really is and how he's just. But it, it could have been it could have been grittier. I think it definitely might have missed the mark there. Well, that, that film's kind of looked upon as his like, sort of like the same way David Bowie did the Let's, da- Let's Dance album, which was sort of like, you know what? I've done everything. I haven't I haven't done a, let me, a commercial album. That's then, something different for me. I feel he, like this was Scorsese's like, let me do a Hollywood film, like with all the accoutrements, you know? And then he does bad right after it. So he go, you know, it goes right, right. into the, well, the right. huge music video. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which, which, so the, so the Michael Jackson uh, bad music video, uh, you know, obviously it is, is one of the greatest music videos of all time. Um, was shot at the Hoyt uh, Shimmerhorn subway station over six weeks. Wow. Six weeks they shot this friggin' video in, in a subway station. Six what, weeks. Do you remember what the runtime actually is on that? How long did past the song does it go? Is it a five minute? I remember. Um, hold on, hold on. If anybody can look up the Michael Jackson bad video, the uncut version, how long does the Michael Jackson uncut bad video run? Yeah, please. I got a feeling it's something like you know, fifteen minutes or really? something. Really? Oh wow! I, I don't know. Let, let's see. Let's I just see. I just remember as a kid, you know, and then you do yeah. too. Is MTV the power that it had over us? Like when you knew that they were playing that music video, you were home in front of your television set yeah. waiting for that thing to air. Like it was it, it was magnetic. And and yeah. as a kid, you know, I remember even all the music videos that came out, but like the ones that were specialty videos, like even the police for every breath you take, there was like three different color correction versions that were out. You had to see all three of them to be cool, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, just, just amazing. That whole era of, of music video. Yeah. And, and I mean, a little, I wonder, so, so this year was 80, yeah, this was 86. I mean, this, this was, um, okay. Danny says it was 18 minutes. Bro. Holy cow. Wow. It's basically a short. It's 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 not even a, sh- a, a short, short film. film. A short yeah. film is six or seven. This is like almost, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, this that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, there's your six weeks. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. it's just just the the setups. I mean, this amazing. Is, well, yeah, yeah, one of the greatest you, music you, videos of all you, time. It's amazing. Like like you know, that that that, that you know, and, and my, leave it to Michael Jackson. I want Martin Scorsese to direct my video. Yeah. Well, and going one more back to the to color of money, um, it was it was I believe it was um, 
Paul Newman's idea to have Scorsese direct the next one because he sent Scorsese the book. Uh, uh, so so I, I think that that's what the thought was that you can. And I think I don't know. if Scor Yeah. Like you said, with Scorsese and this, the whole design of the film is a little bit different. But I think Paul Newman was probably seeing like Mean Streets and saying Scorsese is the guy to direct the sequel to The Hustler. That's right. That's yeah. great. That, 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 that's incredible. Yeah. Uh, Danny says Thriller was almost 14. Wow. Another. Thr and who, uh, I know who directed Thriller. It was uh, that was John Landis. John Landis, yeah. That's a great, that's such a great, that's such a great, that, you know what? That could be the greatest music video of all time. Yeah. Right? Michael Jackson yeah. thriller. I mean, that thing is, that's incredible. Yeah, it's, Love it's it. just insane. And Michael yeah. Jackson for music videos is just like, yeah, just insane. Like the, the amount of work that went into it, uh, it's yeah. just, it's it's for a, for a video director, never mind a music video director, it's just yeah. the greatest stuff you're ever going to watch. Absolutely. And those days are those, you know, those days are gone. Um, so apparently after um, after Color of Money and after Bad, you know, um, he could really write his own ticket, um, Scorsese. And the film that was, you know, his dream film hmm. was uh, this very controversial film, The Last Temptation of Christ. Yeah. Yeah, film that he he wanted to, you know, he said he wanted to make this film his entire life. Uh, this was story. his whole, yeah. Yeah. Right. And I think that's why it sat for so long. So we were talking before about like after hours, um, yeah. you know, with this, this script sat in his office for years untouched because he just didn't know how to approach it. He never thought it would, there would be, you know, someone probably probably came and said, stop moving the goalposts because right. you know, you, you're thinking there's never going to be a right time to make this film. There probably never will be. So you just have to make the film. Um, and, and he was worried about, you know, the backlash, but he received it anyway. And, and he still, you know, made an, an, an amazing film. Um, but yeah, this sat for a very long time. And during the 1980s where he just didn't touch it. Do you, do you, um, have any recollections of this any perspective on this this one was tough this one this film was tough for me um we tried to watch this before you and i decided to do the show me and my gal tried to watch it and it, it we just sort of like it, it 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 didn't it didn't hold it wasn't my passion you know what i mean mm -hmm. it, it like it, it, the characters the whole it, I, I i i struggled with it you know and, and i don't think we finished it um, I mean, it's, it's a great film. I, I, I don't know if I were to watch it tomorrow, if I'd feel yeah. the way I felt about it the first time that I saw it. And I think, you know, some films, they grow on you. I don't think this yeah. one would, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's not like Goodfellas or, or, or yeah. uh, Taxi Driver where you sure. go back and you're on the rewatch and, and you're just like, this is, this is better than yeah. better. And just like, you know, Sopranos, I can watch Sopranos on repeat because it's just like, it's, it's yeah. something that you keep watching. And, that's, and it, that's, that's in your wheelhouse. You love that stuff. Yeah, you know? I do. I definitely uh, uh, do. Yeah. Um, you know, this is one of those films for me that there's films from when, when I, when I was coming up that were just these sort of legendary films that, you know, um, controversial films and i i recently watched a film called heaven's gate recently and about heaven's gate Ooh. well, well uh, uh, the, the the film heaven's gate that mike chimino directed which mm -hmm. was at the time the most expensive film ever made and sunk the 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 um the uh the movie studio and uh you know disconnected from all that sort of um uh, folklore around it and just watched it as a film and really enjoyed it as a film really enjoyed it um i think this is that kind of a film if you you know you think you know, i tried to disconnect from all the other stuff whatever i've heard about it and watch it but i just couldn't i couldn't stay on track with it you know as far as timing goes on this one here's an interesting uh so barbara hershey who played boxcar bertha that's right gave him the book on the set of Boxcar Bertha. That's how long it's 70s. been around. Yeah, you know, he had he had optioned it at some point and then had the script sitting and whatnot. So, you know, he's been, yeah, he had been, never mind as a boy, but even just as a filmmaker, he had this one sitting in, you know, in the stables waiting to, to, to work on it. Yeah, and 62 Lefty Blue says, William Defoe is epic in this. 
The first time I saw it, I didn't like it. But after all the Da Vinci Code stuff, et cetera, really brought some new insight. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. The fun fun fact about Willem, uh, they were giving him some special kind of like eye drops uh, in the film uh, to make to make those like supernatural kind of like look to him, and like he right? went he went blind. Oh, jeez. Uh, yeah, he went blind. I forget for how long, but uh, he lost he lost vision. Interesting. Yeah. Talents that that you do. You, do you ta, it's, Ray Hagel says talents that you deserve a passion project. Do you do yeah. you do you have a, a, a do you have a passion project that you've like carried with you like you know that that you hope to do someday or, or mine's or a book doing, yeah book? yeah my my family um when they when they came over well, there was two stories my when my grandfather came over here from Italy uh and he met my grandmother there's some extraordinary circumstances and and love affair story that kind of happened with them and then my grandmother's sister Aurora. Uh, her her younger sister was a bit of a socialite, and she had this amazing, bizarre love triangle thing happening at the same time. So I, I want to fuse those two stories and and write a story about these young Italian Americans uh, in the 1940s, and and really develop this this uh, book that people talk about uh, forever. Yeah, yeah, I have one, and it's it's starting to come to fruition. I have um, I have a script called Finders Keepers that was written in the 90s. And it's sort of every, you know, a couple of years it bubbles back up, you know, it was, you know, um, but it's actually things are happening with it. I've got some people flying in from the UK, a producer and two cinematographers. We're going to be shooting a sizzle proof of concept thing for it. We got guys lined up. We have all kinds of stuff. And uh, my my passion project, my dream project after all these years is happening. It, it, well, it's it's moving and it's it's taking. No, it's steps. happening. It's Take the universal steps. approach. It's happening. It's happening. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, creative visualization. It's, yeah. And 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 it's it's incredible. Uh, you know, um, this has been a dream of mine. Uh, you know, I'm I'm going to direct a dramatic feature film. You know, amazing. It's been a, been, been a dream of mine. Um, moving forward, um, I guess he directed uh, um, a, a segment of Woody Allen's New York Stories. Uh, in that film, I, I don't remember which one he directed, but uh, the film uh, New York Stories was, I think, like four, three or four or five stories directed by different directors. And then, you know, uh, it brings us to sort of the, the last film uh, in this part one that we're doing, which is, you know, another masterpiece, I, I think. Mm, and, that's, yeah. and, that's, and that's good, fellas. Yeah, pro probably the film that people most associate with Martin Scorsese, you know, the, the duo Goodfellas and then Casino yeah. um, and and just, you know, an absolute masterpiece front to back. The film that you could see a hundred times. And it's just it's it's every it's everything you ever want from a gangster film. Um, you know, the, the the story, the richness, the the grittiness, um, the performances. I mean, there's so many outstanding performances in this film. It's 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 yeah. really hard to watch other films when you're watching something like this, because when, once you watch this film, I need a little break because I just like you can't it just it's incomparable. Do you, do you have any perspective? I, I don't on how Ray Liotta like because he he wasn't in any of Scorsese's movies before this. And he turns up a tour de force performance in this. Do you have any perspective on how Ray Liotta got into this? No, I don't. I yeah. don't. I, I, I'm, you know, a lot of people are trying out for roles like this, just like you know the Mar the Marlon Brando for Don Corleone and the the Al Pacino landing the role of uh, Michael. I I think that he's just looking at performances and look at Ray. I mean, the guy's yeah. just you know if you're just looking at him, he's just. He's static, you know. You're you're going to be fixed on this guy, um, and it's just the the again the performances that came out of this film just unparalleled. Yeah. It's it's hard. It's hard for me to watch gangster films uh, post 1990s because I just don't think that yeah. anyone's going to ever compare to the level that score. The bar is just set so high with Scorsese and Coppola. So is that right, Larry? Larry Kelly says uh, Martin Scorsese saw something wild, which was, okay that that I. I, yeah, I think that I think I said. Let, let me read some of my notes. Uh, 1990 Goodfellas masterpiece, considered one of his greatest achievements. His return to directorial form, 
in his most confident and fully realized film since Raging Bull. De Niro and Joe Pesci offered a virtuoso display of Scorsese's uh, Bruvera cinematic technique in the film and reestablished, enhanced, and consolidated his reputation. After the film was released, Roger Ebert, a friend and supporter of Scorsese, named Goodfellas the best mob movie ever. Mm. Joe Pesci won Best Supporting Actor. Mm. I mean, Pesci, so, you know, there's a lot of people that knew it was Tommy DeVito in, in the film, but it's Tommy DeSimone in real life. Mm. And a lot of the people that knew Tommy DeSimone and saw Pesci playing that character, minus the one fact is that Tommy DeSimone was humongous. He's a big Italian guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Pesci's playing someone, but the ferocity that Pesci, Pesci brings to the table, yeah. people were like, he nailed Tommy DeSimone yeah. in this film. It was incredible. Yeah. It, it was and, incredible. and there's, there's a lot of pesci things that happen in this film, um, like the 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 funny scene. You know that that is is something that Pesci brought to the script. That's not in the book. Um, you know, Pelleggi's original book, Wise Guy. Um, my little small world tie into this film is that my agent, Mickey Freiberg, that wrapped me for the Columbo book, um, was Nicholas Pelleggi's agent for this film that became Goodfellas. So. Oh wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. And he repped. He repped. Uh, Pistone for Donnie Brasco and um, Bonanno for all the Bonanno books. Yeah, well, that, that's a classic, absolute classic. And and you know that's uh, that's Joe Joseph D'Onofrio, you know, yeah. who plays the young uh, Joe Pesci, who's been a guest on the show, who's a great supporter of the show. Uh, you know, he, and this is in in that great scene where where he's he's uh, he's uh, they, they get caught, uh, you know, uh, selling selling the cigarettes. And, uh, here's and kudos another. to him. He looks exactly the same. <laughs> the guy doesn't age, D'Onofrio. I've seen him recently. He does. Yeah. He does. Yep. He, he, here they are uh, at that infamous Billy Bats bar scene. I, I oh, think yeah. that's what this is. Is this pen yours? You know, that whole really. Yeah. This, and, and there's uh, Frank Vincent again, turning up, you know, turning up, you know. Yeah, the, the Frank Vincent Joe Pesci stuff went on. For, I think there's like three films if you want to put them all together. So you, you have uh, Pesci unloading on him. In um, uh, the boxing Goodfellas. movie, no, the boxing oh, no. movie. In, uh, oh, 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 um, uh, Raging Bull. Raging Bull. So then you have Pesci unloading on him and killing him in Goodfellas, <laughs> and then the finale is, is in Casino. Casino, where oh. they get take care of him with the baseball Ooh, basketball. What a, what a brutal really scenes ever. Brutal is, scene. Yeah, yeah. What a, what yeah. a brutal, brutal. But brutal those two, scene. as as friends, have been beating the crap out of each other their careers wow. uh, with Scorsese. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, here's just another shot that I have from when he was on the show is, is Joey D'Onofrio, uh, you know, it, it, a couple years ago, you know, si signing, signing posters, posters, signing nice. posters. Of, you know, it, it, you know, in, in my film, um, uh, finders keepers, there's, there's a character called cancer man who's selling cigarettes out of the back of the end of his trunk. And of course, in the spirit of, of the film, the car, you know, the guy we want to come on and play Cancer Man, sort of reprising his role from Goodfellas would be Joseph D'Onofrio. Amazing. You know? Amazing. Yeah, yeah. So um what um NYC Majestic, thank you for the uh super chat says first time I bought the soundtrack to a film of Peter Gabriel. Oh. Which, what, what, is that Goodfellas? No, that's uh Polar Money. Christ, um, what what was Peter wait, Gabriel? Peter was that... Gabriel, I think this might be a um a miss. Let me see something. Peter Gabriel, what was that? Was that Last Temptation? What what uh, New York New York City Majestic? Be a little more specific. Which, which film was Pete? Was it? What well, might be Temptation of Christ? It might be. Yeah, it might be. It was a Goodfellas, was it? No, there was no Peter Gabriel. I don't remember Peter Gabriel and Goodfellas. No music, you know. Um, but yeah, um, yeah. Here you go, De Niro. Peter Scorsese. Gabriel did the Last Temptation of Christ. Yep. Ah, okay, Christ. Yep. Thank you, thank you, NYC Majestic. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Wow. Got him to go out and buy the the soundtrack. Yeah, that was that was. Uh... Uh, we also forgot to mention that that was also a pairing between um, Scorsese and Schrader again on Last Temptation of Christ, which, which you know, again, him working in that same familiar mix. Um, this one, Pelleggi, the, the pairing could have been better. 
Um, this is just ma a masterpiece. Speaking of music and soundtracks, the music in this film. It, it, it just drives some of those scenes like Rolling Stones. Can't you hear me knocking when, mm -hmm. when, it, when that, that whole, I mean, it, it's like 10 minutes of that song, you know? And, and um, you know, uh, what is it when, when, when I hear, I hear helicopters, Oh yeah. Muddy waters. Yeah. Right? War yeah. Oh. Yep. yeah. Yeah. There's so, so many good actors. Um, just, yeah. just, it, it's insane. Uh, his little yeah. brother, um in the wheelchair oh yeah or wasn't he uh, in um on the sopranos that kid that that stirred the sauce Was yeah it's uh, Ke uh kevin yeah oh my brain my brain's oh, not on it right now sauce. yeah yeah so good and, and then soprano if we're talking sopranos um you know his his wife uh who yeah. ends up becoming the psychiatrist on, on the sopranos is oh yeah right huge. um uh dr melfi mm -hmm. yeah amazing <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah, the, Goodfellas, Goodfellas the, is, is an incredible film. It, and then, like we talked about, his parents turn up in it. it it's just, it, it, it's a great, great film. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, let me see. Yeah. You learn the two most important things in life. Never rat out your friends and always keep your mouth, keep your mouth shut. shut. Yeah. Yeah. So good. good. I always yeah. wanted to be a gang. It's just like, it, it's just... Every single detail in that film, every narration, every piece of wardrobe, every yeah. style shot, like the way that he shoots him walking across the street to the neighbor. You're with him. You feel oh, ferocious yeah. as you approach that guy. Like, yeah, it's just and, and like, yeah, for the graphic nature of how he started filming fighting, because it changes. Right. Like, I mean, if we look at one of the most epic gangster films of all time, The Godfather, the scene with, you know, Sonny uh you know beating up on um on uh carlo, carlo. you know yeah. th you if you break that fight scene down choreographically dramatically you know it wouldn't work today a kid would watch that today and be like what am i watching because we see yeah. it in such a real and i think scorsese was one of the guys on the big screen that really first started to conquer that i think the first time i saw robert de niro that that upward shot of him kicking down was oh, raging yeah. bull when he's kicking down on yeah. Pesci, his brother, and and yeah. then again we see it in Goodfellas, right. and he just right. he brought he brought that real graphic, ferocious nature to filmmaking. You know, um, there's, there's so much, so many incredible scenes. Uh, you know, when when uh, Karen, when 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 uh, De Niro's trying to lure Karen into into the store, to, I got dresses over here, and and she sort of has that moment where she realizes like it's a setup. Like, ew, wow. Um, the, the 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 cool thing on his style also is like how he puts people into situations and maybe they don't understand the situations as well so he can get something from them. So yeah. uh, the scene with his mom when they come over and they've got Frank Vincent in the trunk and that oh. he, he, his prep for her is that she never knew that they had a body in the trunk. She was just supposed to know that they were coming over for a late night snack. So her whole demeanor is completely, you know, unassuming to what's going. She doesn't know what's going on. She's just oh, playing wow. it like they're coming over for some food, you know. And, that's and, and, just, and, and, and so you're saying they show up. He's got blood on him, and she's like, "What's she going didn't know? On? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so they're just filling her in, and it's very, you know, he had a lot of ad lib stuff in his thing, but it, yeah. it's he's a, such a results driven director. And in in this movie, there's just so much where he's just getting again. And the best performances out of some of the greatest actors. Is that right, Murph Quake? The store is on the corner of Smith and Ninth by the Bagel Shop. I, I guess there was a, that that scene that scene uh, from Brooklyn. Hey, okay. let me take let me take quick quick sponsor break and uh, read this stuff out, and then come back and we'll take questions from around the world, and we'll just chop it up for a few more minutes. All right. All right. There you have it. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. Our guest. Is Don Caprio. Any questions, any statements, any anything, you know, go deep, get weird. Uh, we're sponsored by blah, 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 and 126 Hardcore Clothing. They're a streetwear brand for restless individuals who don't compromise. They're about being positive, spontaneous, and true to yourself. For years, they experimented with several printing methods and materials and collaborated with a large number of designers and illustrators, always giving room for fresh perspectives while retaining the hardcore attitude. Get in touch with them. Ramp up your game at www. 126clothing.com. Come on now, Joe Romini and the Texas Silver Rush. They're a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. 
They specialize in working with musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces, as well as the style and for stage, album covers, promo photos, and social media exposure. The client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famers, Greg Roulet, Ringo Starr, and of course, Agnostic Front. Information on online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram pages, and of course, www.texassilverrush.com. Last but not least, come on, Devin. Are you looking for extreme music? DTF and Vinyl has got you, my friend. Located in 13th Avenue in Fargo, North Dakota, we have the state's best selection of punk, hardcore, metal, ska, oi, and more. Can't make it in? Shop online from anywhere in the country at www.dtfmvinyldistro.com. DTFM Vinyl, where the policy still is and always will be. Death to false metal. Uh, that said, I mentioned next up on the show this Sunday, Dave Tree. Some Boston hardcore rep, rep, represent. Also, I will be down screening my new film, which is still amazingly doing the film festival circuit, The Jews and the Blues. I will be down at the Greenville Jewish Film Festival August 27th with my significant other, other the lovely Rochelle. That said, please, any comments, any questions, uh, any statements, any inside knowledge, put it up in the chat room. Let's do a couple more minutes with our guest, Don Capria. Amen. What's going on now? Let's see. Let's see um, what we got here. Okay. Any any good questions? Well, well the- yeah. You know, Ray Hogan, uh, jumping ahead, many of us thought Casino was good fellas in the desert. Your thoughts. We don't want we don't want to get too deep into into Casino because we're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do uh, a, a, a follow up. A part two and a part three. I can see part two. Part man, I, I love the last. And I guess you know we're we're sort of this is sort of segue into that. Man, I'm a big fan of his films in the last ten years. Man, you know, mm. I love The Aviator. I love Wolf of Wall Street. You know, yeah. fucking the, love those films. Yeah, there, there's a lot of later films to discuss. But yeah, yeah. Ray, we would definitely want to but, jump in. There's a lot to discuss about Goodfellas when we start talking about Casino, especially yeah. it's the same writer director, so yeah. same actors. There's so much that is that is the same, but performance wise, we should definitely get into that one heavily. You know, but but while we're here, one thing I said to my gal this morning was, one thing I fucking love about Casino is the wardrobe is is the wardrobe design, you know. Just the, 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 the wardrobe in Casino makes the film, in my opinion. Sharon Stone's cost, Sharon Stone's outfits, yeah, you know, De Niro suits. Fucking yeah. love that film, man. You yeah. know, um, is that right, Matt? Well, thank you. It's been a great show, lots of interesting facts I never knew. Well, thank you. Well, that's what we're, you know, we're trying. Um, let's see. Um, Okay, what's what are you guys going on? What are you guys going on? Uh, uh, hey, Donnie, what did you think about Columbus portrayal in the offer? Um, you know, I I love Rabisi, love him as an actor. I mm-hmm. think that he had an opportunity to watch some tapes on Joe and give a little bit more of an articulated delivery. Yeah. I thought the offer as a whole was a super entertaining television series. Um, not factual at all, like how a lot of that stuff went down with the Joe Colombo and the Italian American Civil Rights League involvement. Sure. It was it was a very um, self preserving show for Al Ruddy, and I get it. He's close to dying. A lot of people have died. He wanted to make something epic. I enjoyed watching it, and I love Rabisi, um, and I'm glad that he cited my book in so many interviews. But I think oh, vi- nice. visually, he um, he could have grabbed a little bit more by seeing how Joe actually his mannerisms and his delivery. Right on. Um, Ray Hogan asks, have you ever met any real life characters from Goodfellas? Any real life characters from Goodfellas? Well, I did. I mentioned I missed I mentioned Joe Joseph D'Onofrio, who who I've I've, you know, spent time with uh, in person. So I'd say Joey D'Onofrio. Um, who else was in there? Oh, um, my girlfriend asked me this the other day, actually. Um, Debbie Mazer. Oh, yeah, she's amazing. Amazing. I mean, if it's if it's about the characters that are played. Melissa, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You mean the Mo- characters? Well, the yeah. Actors? So <laughs> right. the, one, the one that I know and I'm pretty close with is Melissa Prophet, who plays. Um, uh, she plays in both uh, Casino and Goodfellas. Um, 
and she's with she's Debbie Mazar, Mazur's friend in in Goodfellas. Sure. Um, but a, as far as the the characters that are the real life people, uh, no. But working with Anthony Colombo on the Colombo book, I did get a lot of uh, interesting insights on like some of the reality versus what was shown in the picture because sure. uh, Anthony was in the same era amongst all of those guys, right. um, Paul Savino's character, uh, Robert De Niro's character, Joe Pesci's character. And one of the things that he, he told me and everyone should know about this film is while it is a Henry Hill film, um, that the real person, the real linchpin of the crew, the brains, everything that was involved in that entire crew is, is Jimmy Burke, which was yeah. called Jimmy Conway, which was Robert De Niro's character. He, he really thought of Henry Hill as an ant. He was a drug addict, a junkie. He was just around all of these really important people. And Ray Liotta plays such an amazing piece on him. You think that that's like Henry Hill's story, but it's really not. It's Jimmy Burke's story. Very, very, very interesting. Uh, our, our, our friend, the supporter, uh, Victoria, says, Henry Hill actually showed up to the premiere of the Goodfellas movie and spoke to Ray Liotta. Yeah, he, he was around for a lot of stuff. He, he was yeah, not, he was, he was not one of these hidden he, rats. Wasn't he like, uh, uh, like, sort of like a consultant on the film? Yeah, well, it's his, it's the book that he Pelleggi wrote with him. So, right. yeah, of course, you know they're pulling, they're pulling everything from him. It's his story. It's his version of the story. I mean, regardless, I mean, this is you know he's always been a very controversial figure, and I know some things came into play about sort of like the validity of a lot of his sort of uh, escapades, or whether you know, like you said, he was he wasn't a key player, no. you know. So. No, he, he. It was a lot of. That's a lot of self-preservation making that film, knowing that all these guys are dead. Jimmy Burke's never coming home from prison, and I'm going to yeah, do this yeah. book with Pelleggi, and Pelleggi right. made it a, made it a masterpiece. Yeah, yeah, a, a, absolutely. A GP says, "Goodfellas, prison cookie never looks so good." No. Nope. Yeah, they, yeah. You know, you know, you meant you mentioned uh, Paul Sorvino. Uh, you know what? What he really puts in uh, a tour de force as that role, man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and oh, and there's a Michael Jackson tie-in, right? There is a well, yeah, because he put Paul Servino in. Oh, no, 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 the 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 other guy, Tootie. Tootie, Tootie. who plays uh, in Goodfellas, Tootie with the cigar. Yeah, it's Michael Jackson's manager at the time. Oh yes, yes, yes. You're right. He was for years. Yes, yes. yes. I forgot yep. what was his name. Um, but that was Michael Jackson's manager. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes. Um, I don't know if this if this makes sense. Uh, Dom, what are your thoughts on the movie Fingers with Harvey Keitel with the classic summertime restaurant scene? I have never watched Fingers. I don't know this film. Yeah, I don't know Fingers. I'm trying yeah, to we think. Have, we, yeah, we, we have to catch up on that one. Um, okay, RS70 asks, wildest scarhead memory. <laughs> <laughs> too too many to recount, but I mean, <laughs> um, I think you know, we we had a, a Seattle. No, I say probably we had a we had a a close call in a lot of different cities, but maybe the closest call was uh, um, in San Fran, and it was one of those situations where uh, club emptied out and a lot of terrible things happened uh, at post fight. And we were sitting in Los Angeles. I remember in the back alleyway at Loden. And this is pre-internet, pre-phone, you know. Yeah. And we were just wondering if if we were all going to get arrested and go to jail. <laughs> well, there's probably there's probably no greater adventure than to than, than than touring with Danny Diablo. No, it's know? it's it is every single day is a whole brand new movie. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. shout out well, shout out to Danny Diablo. Yeah, yeah. I spoke to him uh, yesterday or today. You know he's coming in to do some reading for my film uh, in a couple of weeks. Awesome, so, awesome. He's got he's got a lot of skills, great presence. You just have to you just have to corral you just have to you know corral him correctly. Now, talking you know director to director here, you know, uh, and, and just you know, love to get your take on it. You know, a guy like that doesn't make sense to give him a bunch of a bunch of a bunch of script. A guy right. like that, you want to set the scene, set the tone. You want to get, you know, explain to me. You want to get from point A to point B and let him and let him go. Now you've worked with him. Is it fair for me to sort of assume that? Yeah, I, I think he's he's very much um, 
you, you know what you're you're trying to get when you actually cast someone like Danny. Not that you're typecasting, yeah. but yeah. in the essence of like your map, you know where he fits on your map for your film. That's right. And and I think having him, you know, step into the role and putting him at ease and not trying to. Ha I think it's the same way. I've been with him on both sides. I, I've you know produced music. I did the. Um, the uh, drug music sex album with him. Yep. And it was the same way in the vocal booth where it was like, you know, you're trying to direct them in a certain way. It, yeah. it, it's, it's got to come from him. So like, I think that's the art of it all. And that's probably where Scorsese was best was like making it come from the artist. Uh, and with Danny, yeah. you want to just have him find it himself as opposed to giving him a script where he has to, you know, recite something. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, Directors, you know, so, you know, so everyone's got their style, right? You hear about some directors who just, hey, I'm hiring you, I, you know, as it, I'm hiring you. Uh, we did a casting session, you know, I'm hiring you. This is the scene. Do you? And yeah. then you have some, you know, some directors, you know, uh, notoriously are like, you have to read every word on the script. This is what I wrote. Stick to the script. Yeah. Stick to the script, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. You've worked, you've worked with, I mean, you, you've worked with a bunch of actors. Um, is it, have you, have you run into instances where you're trying to stick to the script and yet they're not capable of doing that? Um, I think the most frustrating situation is, is when you might be married to something uh, mm -hmm. as as a, a reader of the script and they're reading it completely different and I think the biggest solution for me has been and I just won't approach a film yeah. without it is is a rehearsal on every single thing that you're about to approach and and having them go through uh, repetition exercises and tell them to I think working with them and making them feel comfortable around you where you could say look I want to do a repetition exercise with you which for those who don't know just means trying things different ways just for the fun of it so that we can right. see how you sound when you say give me the money or give me the money you know and and you just have them keep trying it so that you could see which one they're going to deliver that you like the most or fits the I best. See. So I think prep is really the way that I helped break down in my early days of trying to have people do something, um, knowing if they're going to come to the table, at least let them come to the table with me. Let me see it first before we break all this equipment out and start shooting it. You know, sure. And, and, and a, a new, el not a new element, but in my lifetime is back, you know, uh, you know, I remember when you shoot film and like, you don't have, you, you know, you can't just frivolously, Another take, takes. another take, another take, yeah. another take. Nowadays, you kind of can, you know? And, and, kill, and, yeah. And it, it takes, I think it, 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 it's interesting. It's like the same way you have, you have these people, these cameramen at, uh, with their cameras at, at shows, and they're just sitting there spraying. Like, brrr, brrr, and it's just like, that's not fucking photography, man. That's yeah. just, you know, come yeah. on. You yeah, know, there's but, an energy behind a great photo. There's an energy yeah. behind a great shot, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and and a lot of that has to, a lot to do with, you know, being premeditated sure. and uh, and having an approach versus just getting out there and doing it. Yep. Uh, Joe Ackerman down in Tallahassee, Florida asks, yo, Don and Drew, are you big David Lynch fans? My personal favorite. I wouldn't say I'm a big David Lynch fan. I love his work. Um, I'm a little bit more modern. I'm a little bit more of a David Fincher fan. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm a huge fan. Um, Huge, huge fan of Chris Nolan. Just watched his last film, Oppenheimer. Absolutely. Yeah, amazing. we got it. You went to the movies and saw that. Yeah, just blown away. Totally really? blown away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Another another book adaptation that someone had given him years ago, and he read and was like, "I have to make this into a movie." Yeah. I got. We we we. Was it? Did it carry through the three hours? Because that's a long. Oh yeah. Time. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good, good, good to know. And and, and you know what? I, I'm not like a big David Lynch fan. Like my guys are like, um, uh, you know, Werner Herzog is is probably my my huge, huge. Um, next to my dad is probably my biggest um, directing influence or filmmaker. Um, I'm, I'm I I like Ridley Scott a lot. A lot of the stuff really a lot a lot of the early Ridley Scott stuff I like, but. Ridley Scott's made a lot of films that I really love between Blade Runner, Gladiator, you know, Alien, um, you know, so on and so Another forth. Another one that I'm in love with, Ridley Scott. And, and on the newer front, too, is uh, Denise Villeneuve. 
who just did the um he did sicario he did prisoners he did arrival he just did dune he did the blade runner reboot uh the, that was the good yeah. One. Yeah. yeah 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 um yeah, Blade Runner, Blade Runner. And Ridley Scott just is the gift that keeps giving, man. Yes, you know, absolutely he, he, amazing. Just, just amazing. Um, oh, this is okay. So, RSS question for you: Have you ever edited actual film, film, cut and paste? Now, I, I can answer that. I have. My uncle was a film editor, like I said. So, I grew up. You know, my dad was a director. My uncle was a film editor. He was an assistant on The Hustler. He had a company called Stone Cutters. And, you know, I go visit him. And and the early music videos that, like, I did was we cut on film, you know, with my uncle. So so there, there you go. <laughs> these, are, these are the things that filmmakers have. You know, other other people have like things that adorn that you, you know like this is what guys like me and Donnie have around our house. Oh, now we're talking. You're muted. You're muted. The doggo was barking, but yeah, there's there's a Moviola film cutter right there. So now, yeah, um, yeah so. I collect old relics, typewriters, and the yeah. other things and such. But yeah, man, uh, I started my first music videos were 35 millimeters, so. We, yeah. we, we came up in that. And then digital, of course, just made life so much easier. You know, it's, it's an interesting world we live in. Um, I talked to you. I mentioned my dad, who was a filmmaker, and, you know, and, and my uncle. And, you know, my uncle, you know, brings up, you know, films that he worked on. Uh, the Hustler, um, a couple other, you know, and, and other stuff like, like, like that. And um, it's interesting because my kid, who, who, who just, you know, is in his early twenties and, and his girlfriend, who's a filmmaker, a, a director, you know, having a conversation with them, they mentioned Godfather and, um, they never saw it. Hmm. And they, they mentioned, um, hustler. The hustler was, you know, and, and, and my uncle was just flabbergasted that, that, that they wouldn't know about these films, but my dad interjected. And I think, and said, I think this was really, really poignant. He said, when I broke into the films, I wasn't watching the old silent movies. I could care less. I was in the present, you know, looking forward. And I think a lot of that uh, in filmmaking is the case, you know. Sure, we know these films are, 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 are classic and, and incredible, but a lot of young filmmakers today aren't really going back to a lot of this stuff for inspiration, they're being inspired by their peer group and things that are happening in their generation. Yeah, it's, it's why filmmaking changes, right? Yeah. It's because the inspiration changes. Yeah, yeah. And 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 I think this carries over into into music and, and, and even what we're kind of dealing with in, in, in hardcore in a certain way now is that a lot of the older hardcore bands are looked upon now as dad hardcore. Like mm. uh, the the young hardcore bands want nothing to do with a lot of these older older hardcore bands. Oh, my dad used to listen to that or whatever, whatever, you know. Basically, because they have their own bands, they have their own scene, and mm -hmm. that's what motivates them and excites them, and, and good for them. This is Look, this is this is the the generational ebb and flow of things, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's the same in hip hop. I know they're dealing with it, where the the greats yeah. that came from that era. Aren't, yeah. aren't even, you know, they're near, nowhere near the type of fame and notoriety as some of these kids that just kind of come out and they're flashing the pan. I heard somebody, uh, somebody was going on about how they were talking to some young hip hop kid and the hip, young hip hop kid didn't even know who Biggie Smalls was, right? The notorious B.I.G. And mm. it, it, it doesn't surprise me. It's like, it, that's just, you know, that doesn't surprise me. There's kids today that are playing hardcore that have never heard of agnostic front and sick of it all in black flag you know it's just how <laughs> yeah it's just that's just how it is uh that's right that's because youth is wasted on the young that's <laughs> <laughs> absolutely anyway hey man great show don um love having you on fellow filmmaker contemporary and uh, and and i look forward to uh well thank you ray this is the best show in months well well thank you thank you um, ray yeah, man. Looking forward to to uh, part two. 
when we uh, we'll do the middle stuff, and then I think we'll do a part three, which will be you know in a couple months we'll we'll we'll, we'll do part two. Thank you, Larry the Hunter, and thank thanks for tuning in, everybody. Uh, we love doing these the, these kind of shows. Anybody you want to shout out or thank Don? Um, whoosh, give a shout out to Danny Diablo as always, <laughs> um, um, the hardcore legend who always keeps it real, uh, and uh, Melissa Prophet. Who, who's worked with Scorsese so many times and give me some cool stories. Peter Conti, who I, I've co-written with, who also has been in, he's in Casino uh, and he's been around Joe Pesci his entire life um, for lending me the, the the story, some of the ones that I have. Because I think it's always, when you, you know, the great thing is, is watching these movies and then meeting people that were actually involved that got to like tell you something that happened on set or behind the scenes. And it's the, the cool trivia stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. And uh, let's keep in touch. Uh, let, let's talk. Uh, you know, I want to talk to you about what, what, what you got cooking and, uh, you know, tell you about what I, you know, with, with Finders Keepers, how that's moving ahead. Hopefully, maybe you can give me uh, glean some perspective on, on, you know, a couple of things as I, as I head into doing this proof of concept thing. Awesome. Yeah, let's talk after this and uh, looking forward to number two. All right. Talk to you soon, Donnie. Thank you. All right, Drew. Take care. Right. Bye bye. There you have it. Great show today. Thank you all for, for, for tuning in. Uh, Don Capria uh, was a part one of um, the Martin Scorsese retrospective. Just want to remind everybody once again, um, this Sunday, while I will be doing this show, <laughs> if you uh, while I'm doing the show, and I'll probably go have breakfast with these guys on Sunday, but uh, Roger Moret is doing a uh, signing of the United Blood Legacy at our sponsor, Generation Records. There's only 90 each of these. So there you go, only 90. I'm sure big Tony Palmasano is gonna be down there. First one in line. Uh, here it is again, this looks cool. We, I would go, but we have Dave Tree on the show. So if you go down, you better watch the show in, uh... yeah, that's right, Larry. Larry says, my buddy Dave Tree is gonna be on next week. Yep. It's actually this Sunday is Dave Tree. Uh, thank you for the great. Yeah, it was a great show on the Bowery on Sunday. Good one. Thank you. Thank you for coming through. Bowery shows need still still really need your support. You know, it's incredible how many people, you know, aren't coming through these days. Um, you know, hopefully we can we can keep doing them. You know, we just need we need people like you, Dominic. Hey, Dominic, I'm calling you out. Come on down. Uh, Larry the Hunter, make some time. Come down to the Bowery Electric. Um, that said, I think we're good. I think we I think we did we did what we, we came we did what we came here to do, right? It's a great show. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Talk to you soon. Until then, do good things, the good things will come to you. <laughs>